It's been a wild year, and uh, this is our second to last TimCast IRL of the year. We've got some big stories. Ashley St. Clair breaking a big story that there are illegal immigrants who are flying on airlines without IDs at all and being given premium economy. But it's not just Ashley. There have been many journalists, many commentators who have bumped into this, interestingly, because of Turning Point USA's AmFest. Many of these individuals were flying out of the Phoenix airport, and they could see that these airlines are transporting illegal immigrants from border states all over the country. They have packets, they have information. Many of them didn't speak English, and many of them don't even know where they're going. The concern now we're hearing is coming from pilots of these airlines who don't know who they're flying. There's no security screening. They don't know where these people are coming from. There's no medical screenings. And so, of course, naturally, people are quite upset. But it's even affecting big cities like Chicago, where we're actually seeing Democrat voters standing up and they are challenging the mayor. They are criticizing Joe Biden. We even have an alderman in Chicago, a Democrat, saying that these policies are causing them great problems. So we do want to talk about all of that. But more importantly, I think it's a good opportunity to talk about a lot of issues because we have an awesome guest. Marion Williamson will be joining us and we'll talk about her policies, her plans, the polling. And I think it'll be fairly interesting considering she's actually polling quite well among Democrats. But for some reason, I think everybody gets it. The media and the Democratic establishment are none too happy. Before we get into that, my friends, head over to the best song dot com and buy the song. Click download your for your price. <laughs> it is 69 cents and uh, it's looking pretty good. A lot of people have purchased the song. This is uh, the final the final call to action. Uh, the final call to action is today. At midnight, the tracking officially ends, and we will see one week from then where we end up on the Billboard charts, and we're hoping that we did fairly well. The song actually did better than all of our other songs that we've put out, so we're really excited for that. Apparently, we were trending in Toronto and Hong Kong. Surprising. And a special shout out to the Daily Wire crew, Jeremy Boring, Michael Knowles, for the original song, the lyrics which we used, and for helping promote as well. It's looking really, really, uh, really great. So let me just say, to each and every one of you who want to help us smash through the gates of these institutions and the machines that seek to keep us from it. Download this song for 69 cents. It's the last opportunity, and we really do appreciate all of your support. It's looking pretty good, but uh, I got to say, we are finding out just now in the 11th hour, they're saying that something's wrong with the tracking and the online streams. Sorry, but we don't know if we're going to be able to count these. And we knew this was going to happen, which is why we heavily prioritize sales instead of saying, go watch the YouTube video like we did in the previous uh, releases, because they keep trying to play this game with us. It is what it is. <laughs> if everybody who is listening right now downloaded the song, we would shatter our way into the Billboard charts. So uh, with your support, we can make that happen. Also, head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. We are going to have a members-only uncensored show coming up. It should be a lot of fun. So smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends. As I already mentioned, joining us tonight is the lovely Marianne Williamson. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Marianne Williamson, and I'm running for the Democratic nomination for the presidency. And, um, yeah. <laughs> right on. Right on. Is there anything else? I mean, I know, I know you're an author. Is there anything <clears throat> right, else in, in right, your career that right. you'd like to... I've had a 40-year career. I've written 15 books on inspirational spiritual subjects. I write and talk about the universal spiritual themes at the heart of all the great spiritual and uh, religious traditions. I wrote a couple of books that are about politics. Uh, I've been a nonprofit activist. I founded nonprofit organizations, uh, one that was an AIDS organization that has served 16 million meals uh, to homebound people. It began as a an organization that would serve meals to homebound people with AIDS, and it, as it has continued through the years, it's to all homebound people dealing with critical illness because, fortunately, there's less of the AIDS-related um, situation in Los Angeles today, although it still exists, obviously. Um and I've uh, founded, uh, co-founded peace uh, organizations. I was once a, non, a non-denominational minister wow. uh, at a, a non-denominational church in uh, Warren, Michigan. So I've done a lot of things. And this is my second time running for president. Right on. And you, we actually have uh, one of the recent polls showing you at 13% among Democrats. So it's actually, you're doing fairly well. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of that. Thank you. But uh, I'm really excited to have you here. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Phil Labonte is hanging out. Hello, everybody. My name is Phil Labonte, uh, lead singer of uh, the heavy metal band All That Remains, uh, very failed musician, um, anti-communist. 
Counter Revolutionary. We're here with Ian. Yeah, the guy. <laughs> I'm gonna make some. I want to. I want to bring some scientific realism to these crystals in front of me because people may made fun of me in the past. Crystals yeah. actually do vibrate. You know, this thing called sympathetic yeah. vibration, where harmonic resonance can cause one crystal to start vibrating, and then other crystals across the room will start vibrating. And your bones have are made of crystal called hydroxyapatite in conjunction with other materials. So we're vibing. This Literally. is why whenever Allison and I go out, we buy Ian rocks. Oh, and that's also why I got to chill. Keep your tone cool because a lot of communication is in the tone. So let's have fun. Thank you for buying yes. those rocks for me. Absolutely. He has a ton. Like we the bought vibrating all. rocks. I think what you said relates to what we were talking about with Twitter before, that a lot of communication is in the tone. Yeah, and with text, it's lost. Mm -hmm. Text is just throwing a piece of paper at someone, basically. Yeah. I mean, I've had uh, somebody once said to me something about something I... I didn't like your tone or something. I said, it's a text. <laughs> there is no tone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, let's get into it. We got Surge pressing the buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm hanging out. Uh, let's just start the show. We're going to start with this story from Ashley St. Clair because, you know, I'll be completely honest. I think this is an, we, have a, we have a great opportunity to talk about uh, much, much larger issues as we're, we're ending out the year. Uh, tomorrow we'll have James O'Keefe and it will be our last show of the year. So we're really excited. But uh, this is still a very interesting story coming from Ashley St. Clair, which can kick off an immigration discussion. Ashley St. Clair tweets, I am in possession of legitimate major airline boarding passes for migrants that quite literally have the name printed as no name given. Incredibly, incredibly difficult to post these without putting the insiders at risk working on it. This will continue to unfold over the coming weeks, but I confirm these are legitimate boarding passes. I am at a loss for words for what I am verifying. Thank you to everybody reaching out. Ashley St. Clair also tweets, receiving all of these tips, I was able to call many sources directly here on X. A pilot who wanted to remain anonymous, anonymous was able to create a burner account, join our space, and use the built-in voice change feature to stay safe. She then celebrates X, the best platform so far. But the big news that we've been seeing over the uh, past couple of days is record-breaking illegal immigration flowing into Eagle Pass. We're seeing now over 10,000 per day. They're estimating around 270 or so thousand individuals coming in just this month. And it's resulting in even Democrats in cities like Chicago, where we're getting uh, a lot of anger. Let me see if I have this one. So, uh, not that one. Where Where's the, the story at? Do we have the... Uh... Well, we have this one from the Daily Mail. Furious Chicago resident rips into Mayor Brandon Johnson for throwing open the door to thousands of migrants and letting down black communities. I think this is obviously a major issue. And some of the latest polls on Donald Trump show that he is... Uh, uh, rising significantly, especially on, uh, among young people. And it's because the economy and immigration are huge issues for people. But uh, let's just, we can just kick off the conversation with you, Marianne. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on all of this. I think that in this, as in so many areas, we have to treat root causes. We have to ask, we have to ask why are people working, going through sometimes the most hideous journeys, like through the Darien Gap. The Darien Gap in Mexico is one of the most inhospitable areas in the world. So what would make someone walk across the Darien Gap with two small children? Well, obviously desperation. So what what is the despair? There are two main categories. One has to do with economic destabilization in these countries, uh, which has caused all this economic desperation. And the other is the horrible violence that is perpetrated by the drug cartels. Now, I think that we need to look in the mirror, because if we look at all of this economic despair, a lot of it was contributed to mightily by U.S. foreign policy over the last few decades. One of the things that we have to do, for instance, we need to end the sanctions on Cuba. We have to end the sanctions on Venezuela. I think a lot of people have no idea what violence this does to the lives of ordinary people. We say to ourselves, well, we're going to have a sanction on this country, and it's a sanction against the bad guys who are the leaders. And then the story went that uh, the ordinary citizen in that country would realize that, that this is what was causing it, and they'd rise up against the leader. Well, it doesn't work that way. First of all, the leader has cryptocurrency. The leader has bank accounts in Switzerland. The, the leader has castles in Monte Carlo. We saw this with the sanctions on the Russian oligarchs at the beginning of the Ukraine war. They're like, whatever, right? So how ironic that in countries like Cuba and Venezuela, our sanctions are leading to a lot of the despair that is then making people come here. We give something like 200 million in general in humanitarian aid to um, Latin American countries. I think if we really look honestly at what we have done 
to many of these countries over the last two decades, we would see a lot more uh, of a reason and a justification for us seeking to stabilize, helping stabilize some of these economies. I also think that we should end America's war on drugs because our war on drugs actually contributes. It, it helps the drug cartels because it creates all that black market. So yeah. I think that we can talk all day long. I was in Eagle Pass several weeks ago. I saw the concertina wire. I saw the buoys that a federal judge has now told Greg Abbott that he cannot use. I saw where 1,500 people drowned in the um, Rio Grande River. Um, and I heard officials down in, in Eagle Pass say to me, we feel oppressed by the state government and we feel neglected by the federal government. Because those people who are down there know how to handle this. They know how to do the processing. They know what is needed and they're not listened to. And so this is interesting. We have a uh... This story, I want to. I just want to pull this up. This is from ABC. Appeals court orders Texas to remove floating buoys from Rio Grande. That was earlier in uh, uh, the month. But we also do have this story from the Post Millennial. Federal judge forbids Biden administration from removing Texas's border barriers. So I think they the 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 buoys over the water. I think had to come out because of international waterways restrictions. But we started to see with the uh, the razor wire. Uh, federal agents were lifting it up and allowing people to enter. And now I believe that's being barred. And Texas has just passed a state law banning illegal entry into the state. But the state, Greg Abbott is overriding federal jurisdiction. Uh, he does not have, once again, this is why they're saying oppressed by the state government um, and neglected by the U.S. government. It, Greg Abbott is taking on authority that governors do not have. The, well, these are to be these are laws that are to be, to be passed by Congress, not by state governors. But what what happens when you have ten thousand people per day entering your state in your city? Once again, there's nothing you can do on the level of symptom that's going to fundamentally fix this. This is why we must address the underlying causes. We can talk about whether or not people are detained. We can talk about whether or not people are deported. <clears throat> but until we actually address the root cause of the problem, this is going to remain with us. I thought, I, I it, agree, but we can't ignore. Mm -hmm. 10,000 people per day. I mean, if uh, if we use an analogy, if you, you say symptom, I'd imagine someone gets shot. We do need to stop shooting, but you still have to tend to the wound. And also the people that are coming over, they're, they're not really predominantly from South America. They're coming from all over the world. So I understand your point about addressing the the problems in, in you know, in South America or addressing the some of the things like sanctions and stuff. I understand that. But doesn't it, like, it do, doesn't that not you know, cover the problem if most of the people are coming from other places like, you know, Africa and Asia? I think we also, though, need to look at the overall picture of immigration in this country because that we can have an argument at numbers and it's a legitimate argument. But I think we also need to stand back and look at the overall picture, which is statistically an immigrant to this country from anywhere, if they are given for one year the help that is necessary to integrate, et cetera, Within a year, they are self-sufficient. And if you look at the big picture of immigration in the United States, the immigrant population is a contributor to the U.S. economy and not a suck on the U.S. economy. You know, 150 years ago, it was don't let in the Jews, don't let in the Polish, don't let in the Irish. And there's a lot of that same kind of racism that is going on today. So we have to ask ourselves, it's one thing to have a conversation about the numbers and the overwhelm, but it has, to me, uh, uh, now leaned over into a, a mean-spirited attitude towards immigrants, which is not in keeping uh, with the better angels of our nature. Where did your great-grandparents come from? I mean, um, all four of my grandparents came here seeking to escape oppression. What about yours? Neither of you, none legally. of you are descended from, from uh, enslaved people I am. or from indigenous people. Are you? I'm part Korean. Well, so, so but I, not by the United States. They right. were not enslaved by the United <laughs> States. But my family was uh, persecuted when, during, the, during World War II with Japanese internment because they didn't care for the difference between different types of Asian people. So my family was forced to flee and hide. And um, my, uh, my mom's side of the family, which was mixed race, had to pretend like they weren't actually related because it was illegal at the time because of miscegenation laws. And so the stories I grew up hearing was... Uh, my family fled 12 different states once people found out that it was a, a mixed race family, you know, pre-1967 and would be spit on by people for being what they would call Japs, despite the fact that I am part Japanese, but mostly Korean. So uh, 
that that is a component and not to say that we are descendant from american slave or anything like that but my point is that so your family found they found safety and asylum and a better life in the united states right oh yeah absolutely so isn't there a moral responsibility that those of us who are descended from people like your parents, like my grandparents, no. who found that. We don't have a moral responsibility to make sure that others experience that blessing as well? I, no, no I, because I there's yes. a whole lot of people in the world like that. If we have a moral responsibility to some, wouldn't that say mean we have a moral responsibility to the, to the world? Yes. And then that's a moral responsibility to everybody on earth? No, not everybody's trying to come here. But, but would I don't want to come here. I but, imagine but, there's a lot of people that want to that but can't I, make I, 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 I think but the answer you know, is yes. Legal immigration, I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I, I was gonna. Say, I was gonna agree. I, I believe the answer is yes. However, it has to be legal, yeah. right? We we right now. What you know with with. I think your view on we must treat the symptoms. There's a lot of symptoms, and I can respect absolutely. I question when we give money to these South American uh, and Central American countries, and their oligarchs and their autocrats steal the money, and it doesn't help the people at all, and exacerbates violence, the drug, or all absolutely. That stuff. I want to treat that, but then there is another issue. The American citizens of Eagle Pass are suffering. And I don't believe it would be appropriate to just say, we will provide no reprieve for you in the immediate because we're dealing with larger issues internationally. But this, wait this a minute, what you conflict. just said, I was just in Eagle Pass. Go down to Eagle Pass because I think you might be surprised by the stories that you hear from the people there. You know, I grew up in Texas. I grew up in Houston. People have been walking back and forth, Mexico and Texas, literally for centuries. Yeah. Literally for centuries. And the people in Eagle Pass that I spoke to absolutely know how these processing centers could work, how the medical could work. It, it could be set up very differently than it is. And the people in Eagle Pass are the ones who would know what to do. But what about, for instance, the people in Chicago, the black community specifically that has been an uproar Wait, over the past several months? You said that plane came from Phoenix. So my question was, which governor, like we know, for instance, remember when Greg Abbott sent all those um, immigrants on a bus to Massachusetts? Is Massachusetts a sanctuary state? Pardon? Is that is Massachusetts a sanctuary to, state? To Nantucket. Yeah, it was a it was a to Cape Cod or, to Cape Cod or, or something. Martha's and Vineyard. now when you read the follow up stories, they're all doing well. Well, they yeah, but they well, didn't they were stay deported there. out of Nantucket. Pardon? They, they were didn't. removed from Nantucket. The the the, the, lo the local residents revolted and then put them all in buses and sent them out. Yeah, they they were there for like a week and then they were like, like get beat it. Get out of here. The way they were complaining. They were they were, they were having having uh meetings, town meetings and stuff. That we don't have a place to put the put all the people. We don't. You know, we're we're a a, a vacation town and blah blah blah. They could have put them. Yes, in, Ma in Massachusetts Airbnb. is a sanctuary. Is is a, a de facto sanctuary state according yeah. to wgbh.org. So the argument, I suppose, from the likes of Texas is, if the federal government is going to remove border barriers, allow these people to enter under their federal jurisdiction, why not send these people to states that welcome them? No, I understand. But then you end up with Chicago residents. And so Chicago, it's, it's devastating because I'm from, I bring that up only because I'm from there. I know this is affecting a bunch of other cities. My friends are saying the police departments are done. They're shut down basically because they were overrun. In the past few days, they've announced they're removing the migrants from the police stations to try and find other places. But the scary thing now is they're talking about building camps to put these people in. Like with, like, I, I, that's, I think that's the horrifying. The situation to be handed at the, handled at the border, obviously. But what I heard and saw at, legal, at Eagle Pass was that there are ways to handle it at the border. It's Congress that has, uh, there's been a dereliction of duty for years. Because everybody says on the left and the right, we want them to be able to legally immigrate. I think people want to legally immigrate. But the, but the, the Congress has laws, or there, there are plenty of laws to... To, that can moderate the people coming over the border that are coming, at least people that are coming over illegally, if if they would enforce it. But the Department of Homeland Security is not the for, enforcing the the laws at the border, if I understand correctly. Mayorkas was just on the Hill recently, and and if I understand correctly, provided ex exceedingly unsatisfactory testimony about what they're doing. He was swearing up and down that he was doing what his what he's supposed to do, but. The evidence is that we continue to have record numbers of people crossing the border. And we have had, I mean, this year is, is the, the, the highest record, you know, on or the, the this, record. This month stuff. particularly. This, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, 10,000 so people per day. Millions and millions of people are coming over the border. So but, what do you do when the government, when the, the, the executive won't enforce the laws, won't tell the, the, the guy that runs the border security to enforce the laws. And then when the guy's brought in front of Congress, he's just like, nah, man, we're totally doing it. And then, and everyone's like, well, I guess he's doing it. Cause and I mean, and nothing gets done. 
And, well, and, and, I, I didn't you know, see that testimony, and I didn't, I didn't read the. They were talking about uh, impeaching Mayorkas. Wow, you know, right? I, if I remember correctly, I think if we zoom out and take like a macro look, regardless of what an individual community like Chicago or Eagle Pass might be saying, you have uh, Abbott in Texas at a state level takes the view that this is a serious problem that is not being resolved by the federal government, and the federal government's view is that for whatever reason it should be encouraged and facilitated. Uh, encouraged in the sense that they were using heavy machinery to lift up Texas's border barriers, were filing lawsuits to remove the barriers and bring these people in and then fund the transport of uh, these people on planes and buses into other places. So something is happening in Texas where locally the governor says it is politically expedient for me to end all of this illegal immigration. And then something is happening federally where the administration says we will not do anything to stop it. And this creates a conflict where the state is putting up razor wire, suing the federal government to stop them from impeding on their borders and tr and then sending these people out on their own buses to Chicago, to uh, New York. And then you have the federal government trying to actually bring more people in. I mean, I, I see that as an untenable situation. I saw the buoys and I saw the, the memorial that was erected to the people who had drowned. It is absolutely morally unacceptable. Those buoys, people drown because of those buoys. Uh, well, I mean, if, it, if the people choose to enter a river and come here, with those risks once if, again for me that goes back to the the trauma in someone's life that would make them t take a journey like that on foot over a desert through the Darien, Darien Gap and for the United States to look looking at for in work. what ways have we contributed to that despair if you look at US foreign policy in Latin America over the last few decades you do you see how many ways we have not supported democracy but we're, we we talk no, about I, I, but I, I'm American foreign policy. Has I mean, been you guys were talking about the CIA psychotic. and all that stuff. <laughs> how, how, all the things you were saying about the CIA before we went on, you think that, that those things were not happening no. in Latin I think it's America? Worse than we probably think. I think that most of our immigration is, if I understand correctly, most of our immigration problem is not coming from Latin America. That's honestly a lot of the, a lot of the people being reported are from North Africa mm -hmm. or I, I, uh, uh, and I think a lot of it is economic destabilization through the Federal Reserve System. This this fiat currency, this we've just totally annihilated the global economy by printing 880, tr whatever, to eight trillion in the last few years. So the symptom is it's caused by the United States corrupt economy over the last 50 years. Basically, the problem is when you look at a body, you can say, like, look, we're causing a problem in the body. We're causing a problem in the body. Something bad is going to happen. And then all of a sudden it explodes. And now we don't really have a, it. We remember what was causing it, but now we need to treat the, the explosive uh, pr result. And the result is 300,000 people came. If it takes one person one year to adapt, we have 300,000 new ones this month. That's like almost un untenably unadaptable. I don't understand. I don't know how. How yeah. we can ease these people in at that rate? Well, you got to stop well, the bleeding no, well, no, first. No, I mean, look in Chicago, I, I find I find this unacceptable. In Chicago, they are building. Uh, I, 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 I hate to use the term because I don't know what other term there is, but concentration camps. I want to draw the distinction between obviously World War II, but they are building camps and they are forcing these people into them, and it's causing a major crisis. The locals are furious. In the, the winter in Chicago. In, in, in the winter in Chicago. Schools. Parents are screaming that they started putting these people in the gyms of, 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 of middle schools. The last thing I think anyone will tolerate is hearing that the federal government is loading people up on buses and trains and but sending them to But it wasn't the camps. federal government that did that. That would have been, the, that would have been a governor. That would have been a state. What, Illinois. It, it's the mayor, I believe. The mayor and the governor. The mayor Illinois. is receiving it. That, yeah. uh, Johnson is the mayor in Chicago. But I see what you're saying. He's receiving them. Well, the, so we do know for a fact that the Biden administration is facilitating the, 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 the transport of migrants to various locations. How do we know that? So there was uh, numerous reports, notably one out of Tennessee, where Republicans actually filmed the transport of migrants, underage uh, 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 migra illegal immigrants coming from the border, were loaded on the planes and flown into Tennessee. This particularly enraged, I think it was a senator from Tennessee who then came out and said, why in the middle of the night? Our, our planes being chartered by the federal government to send these people into our state. There was actually whistleblower footage from Westchester, New York, where a I believe it was a police officer said, if the American people knew what the government was doing, paying for the trafficking of these minors from out of the country into New York. Wait, be paying for the trafficking. Be careful with that word. You just said paying for the trafficking. Yeah. Trafficking is a specific word. It doesn't just apply to transportation. 
Well, if you if you take an undo, uh, 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 a minor who's not from this country mm -hmm. and facilitate their transport from out of the country into a part of the country, that's human trafficking. So the coyotes, for instance, are human traffickers. They yeah. so when you have someone in, let's say, either it's uh, uh, Southeast Africa, one of the one of the big reports is a large amount, large amount of people are are paying for travel to Brazil and then traveling from Brazil up to Central America and through here, they're paying human traffickers to do that. So the traffickers facilitate a plan, a path. And then the Biden administration, working with the traffickers, facilitates the transport of minors into uh, deeper into the United States might, from the border. It might actually be considered human smuggling. Trafficking is specifically um, for commercial exploitation, sexual slavery, or forced labor. And so, I don't think the, the U.S. government knowingly facilitates that. But they may be smuggling people in. Well, smuggling people in is definitely part of the trafficking problem. There's no doubt about that. And I mean, it, by definition, they're smuggling people. And it can happen um, in inner inner country, like internationally or intranationally. There's there's one thing that I want to talk about uh, that when it comes to immigration. One of the things that that people neglect to address is when you have people like that are leaving. I mean, yeah. Look, I'm sorry. Just it. It. This is this was a huge story a couple of years ago, and this is NBC New York, 2000. Uh, uh, migrant children, undocumented, flown into Westchester with bipartisan uh, 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 politicians demanding answers from the Biden administration who won't tell them what's going on. And the smuggling is distinct because uh, it characterized by the consent of the person being smuggled. So, so smuggling is probably a better uh, answer uh, or better, better word to define it. And the question then becomes, why is it that if Democrat and Republicans in the area are demanding to know why the federal government is doing this, do we not have, we don't, we don't have answers as to what's going on. So- uh -huh. You know, in, in, in the big picture, I can say this. Certainly the people who are watching this show are furious about what's happening in, in Texas and Florida and, and the southern border states because they're, they're bearing the brunt of this. So Greg Abbott, Ron DeSantis, other governors say, why don't we send these people to sanctuary states that have passed laws to protect them because they seem capable and willing to help them. But now we see Illinois, New York, and Pennsylvania furious that it's happening and, and arguing that it's in fact the fault of Greg Abbott that they're facing this crisis when, I mean, as you argued, it's the federal government who has the authority to do it. And Greg Abbott actually has no authority to stop the waves of migrants that are coming in. Well, I would be very interested in reading that. But also when you talk about the people who are so upset about it in Texas, I think a lot of the uh, issue of who's upset about it in Texas has to do with particular political orientation. But does that matter? Yes, it does, because there are, listen, I'm not arguing about whether or not too many people are coming in, but I do think a lot of the hysteria, even before, even a year ago, before it was as, as many numbers as it is, there was a lot of anti-immigrant fervor that was based not on a realistic appraisal of what occurred, what was occurring, but rather on, 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 on racism and anti-immigrant uh, uh, perspective. You know, Ronald Reagan gave six million immigrants amnesty. When I was yeah. growing up, if you wanted to come into this country, uh, if you wanted to be a citizen, all you had to do was walk down to the to the registry do office. You, do you think that, that the United States is a more racist country now than we were, say, 20 years ago or 50 years ago? Oh, that's an interesting question. No, because we're not uh, we're not a monolith. But I do think, you know, so you can't say what kind of a country we're, but I will tell you this. When I was a younger person, I'm not whitewashing or glamorizing or romanticizing the America I grew up in, but I will tell you this. There was a greater consensus that we were not supposed to be. But this is not just about race. This is about everything. When I was growing up, obviously, we've never been without racists and homophobes and anti-Semites and bigots. Of course, we've never been without those people. We're human beings. But when I was growing up, there was a greater sense we weren't supposed to be those things. And you had a sense that neither major political party would give uh, the megaphone, a major megaphone, to anyone who spoke from those kinds of places. Today, largely, largely because of social media, people have felt now free to give voice to, to sentiments that when I was growing up, at least there was a healthy sense of shame in the country. And we knew, you know, yeah, there's we should no, try not there's to There's no that. shame anymore. There's no shame. And, and, some, and there is such a thing as healthy shame. And yes. that's what disturbs me, that people feel so permitted to express views that are so morally repugnant to a do conscious you think person. It's, 
do you think that it's better if people don't express m- morally repugnant views? Because my, it's my, it's my assumption, or maybe it's my guess, that it's better to hear people express bad views so you can challenge them, or at least so you know who they are and what they're thinking, as opposed to people that don't express their b- bad views and, and essentially are hiding, you know, bigoted or, or whatever thoughts. I think it's better if, if we know what people are saying and where they're coming from, and, and so that way we can push back on the ideas, or so that way you can avoid those people. Like, I'd rather know if someone didn't like me. Well, I think social media has changed all that. I think before social media, there would be a a degree on which I would agree with that. Social media, when people are saying these things for the clicks, we, you know, it's like I remember hearing Sasha Baron Cohen say, if Hitler were alive today, he'd be taking out 30 second ads on Facebook. We, some truly, truly hateful things uh, are being said in a way that I do not believe makes for a healthier society. So this is this was one of the big stories. October 2021, Biden secretly flying underage migrants into New York in dead of night. They had Westchester County police standing by as passengers were arriving. And this was just the first. We well, all... that's the New York Post, though. So I'd have to read that, Tim. I can't. If the New York Post writes an article like that, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, yep. I'm interested. Trust me. I mean, I will follow up on a lot of this, but I don't look at an article in the New York Post and go, oh, that's totally what's happening. I don't know. You know, I. I, I find that like I have a lot of love for humanity in general, just in general. I see humans' eyeballs and I see like consciousness, but there's I mean, also I, I, a NBC, concept. NBC is sufficient though, right? There, there's a, well, we, yeah, let's no, go into that, it. That's just disturbing. And I, and I don't see it as a left-right issue that that's disturbing. That's disturbing. I think, I think this is one of the reasons why Joe Biden's failing in the polls. I think more and more people are waking up to realize that, you know, although it was initially reported by the New York Post and many people, I mean, your opinion seems to be lower of them. NBC News had the story two days later confirming basically the same thing, mm-hmm. and it's only gotten worse. And w- when I when I first hear that Joe Biden, or I should say his administration, because I don't know to what level he actually knows, is actually engaged in the practice of, uh, what word do we want to use, smuggling? Uh, uh, Technically. Non-citizen, and I'll be very, very careful, I'm very, very light with my language. Children who are not from this country and do not have status are being flown in by the Biden administration in the dead of night to various states without the consent of the people who live there or the local government, sparking bipartisan outrage. This sounds criminal. I think the reason, uh, this is actually exactly what I was talking about, that people love, want to love and want to be there for all the other people, but there's this concept called toxic compassion that I've been thinking about for the last couple of years where it's like, you wanna help everybody and then you end up helping no one. And and people are so obsessed with helping every person that comes by that it ends up like a white-tailed deer overpopulation out we destroy so i'm i'm very i i just don't think we can help everyone and i don't even think we can help most people i i, I don't we, we have limited time so i would like to move on to some other subjects and then definitely get into the area of the media you're polling so but one thing i did want to uh, ask you about was your position on one of the big culture war issues in this country is in florida they announced that that that, that they would be barring certain books from curriculum that contained adult materials. And this resulted in big headlines like this about, uh, well, this is not the one. Uh, Orlando newspaper publishes spread of 673 books banned in Florida County in 2023. I was curious uh, if you knew a lot about what was going on nationwide with the removal of certain books from school curriculum and what your thoughts were. I'm very much against book banning. I think book banning is, is, is basically fascist behavior. Some of the books that are being banned, there is a, uh, there'll be a suggestion of homosexual feelings, so they call it uh, so so they call it pornographic and something ch- children shouldn't read. I trust uh, teachers and librarians, and I don't like the idea of the U.S. government or state government telling librarians or teachers what they can teach. You, no. you don't you don't think there's you don't think we should have laws on any, like what, what about a Playboy? Like if a Playboy was in a grade school, would that be an issue? A Playboy magazine? Yeah. Yeah, as a parent, I'd have a big big problem with a what, Playboy magazine. What, yeah. if th- what if there was a book being given to middle schoolers that depicted giving blowjobs? Uh, I w- yeah, not. well, okay. W- once again, if, yeah, I wouldn't want my child to read that, and I definitely would be wanting to work this on- This is the book. Okay. That's, that's school board. 
That's not government, let, that, not the U.S. government or, or I don't want the U.S. government and I don't want the state governor telling me the books cannot be uh, taught. If I were a parent, and my, I am a parent, if, I, if my child in the eighth grade, I would definitely be going to the school. I would definitely be working with the school board and I, and I definitely would have a problem with that. Is it, what if the school board, if it doesn't do anything about it, then do you have to appeal to the state? I don't want this. I don't want a governor telling uh, uh, colleges what classes they can teach. This isn't colleges. This is no, like, and, and even the that's grade, grade school. Yeah, no, I don't think the governor is to be telling schools what they can teach in the eighth grade. I would have a problem with that, but that's school board. If and then you elect people to your school board. If you had a <clears throat> a child between the ages of ten and twelve, and the teacher was providing them instruction on how to use anonymous gay sex apps, uh, would you call the police on that on that teacher? I would, def I would definitely go to the principal right away. Police, if, I have a if, problem with bringing the police into that. But going to the principal, you better believe I would. And I would show is, up at the school board as well. So so I, the reason why I bring up these, these are very specific examples. Uh, this book is gay. Uh, we have this story from uh, ABC. Parents call cops after teacher offers this book is gay to middle schoolers in Illinois. This book provides instruction on uh, for the use of uh, gay dating apps for anonymous sex. And these are middle schoolers. These are, these are 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So the parents finding out that the teacher was doing this, I mean, that's that's pedophilia. That's that's grooming behavior. That, that, that is outright egregious and illegal. When, I, I don't even want to say conservatives, but it seems to be the case when, uh, let's say someone like me, I'm from Chicago, and I grew up with a Democrat family. When I find out that adults are providing children this kind of stuff, I say, that's a bad thing. We shouldn't allow that. However, for some reason, I end up with, uh, we had the woman, um, what was her name from the, the majority report? Emma Vigland. Emma. Emma Vigland came on and actually defended that these books be kept in middle schools. No, I would not agree with Emma Vigland. Yeah, I think so, she hadn't read the books either when she made that statement. I could but, be wrong. So, so, so this, is the, this is the culture war issue. I, I, and the reason why I bring it up is I often find that people who would align themselves as more Democrat or left-leaning are not familiar with the books in question that are being challenged by parents. And so you end up with these stories that are not correct. They'll say something like, you know, oh, to kill a mockingbird. And it's like, I, 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 not I'm not I'm not concerned at all about ideas and philosophy. You know, I think critical race theory as a philosophy, it can be taught in schools. But as uh, as praxis, I don't yeah. think that's appropriate. So the criticism became with Florida. It, it's not that they had books on critical race theory. It's that they had critical race praxis in books, which... But what are you calling critical race practice? Praxis. So, uh, for instance, there is a... Uh, what was one example? We had... Um, oh, I forgot the woman's name. Uh, was it Asra Nomani? Yeah. That was her name? Mm -hmm. One of the... A lot of the books that they were bringing into Florida would say something like, you know, we have the classic math problem where it says a train leaves Cincinnati traveling 50 miles an hour and a train departs Pittsburgh traveling or whatever. And you know, at what point do they pass? But now what the books are doing, it'll say Evan is white and has been detained by police two times in the past year. Jamal is black and has been detained 17 times. What percentage of the times have police been racist? And these are the kinds of questions that are being put in books. So, in, so this is called praxis where the idea of the ideology is embedded in a separate subject. Parents were upset saying, hey, this is ideological and not relevant to the subject of science or math. We don't want this as part of the curriculum. That's and, interesting. and so then what ended up happening is they say, OK, well, we're going to remove this from, from curriculum. But then, of course, the media reports it as Republicans ban books. But at the, well, but see, even the way we're contextualizing the conversation, I don't think is very helpful. I don't think it's a left right issue, for instance, if you are a parent and you don't want your child in the seventh grade reading a book about blowjobs. I mean, that's just, that, uh, to me, that's not a left-right issue that the child is learning about that in school. But to me, as an American, not as a left-winger, but as an American, I do want my child to learn, for instance, about unequal application of criminal justice uh, when it comes to race. So, if a black person is uh, given a sentence in a, in a, in a uh, courtroom in the United States, it, that black person is liable to have a 20% longer sentence. What I didn't like about what you said was it was a specific project, projection onto the police. 
when not every policeman is racist. That's praxis. However, yeah. the idea, though, that the white person is stopped so much less than the black person, I don't have a problem with kids learning that in high school. But shouldn't those, shouldn't topics like that be their own subject as opposed to mixed into other topics? Because what, end up ha- what ends up happening is if you're teaching kids math and you're adding additional subcontext like that. yeah. then that's then then you end up with with people that aren't learning the subject they're supposed to be learning and that's part of why our 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 schools have such a problem with with making uh making test scores and ha- we have kids that are graduating without you know that can't read at grade level some can't read functionally can't read at all and a lot of it is because of these kind of uh, this, this means of teaching the, this for the for the type of the type of teaching and the framework they use it's, it's part of the read i mean there's a lot lot of reasons there's 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 parents aren't aren't making sure their kids are getting to school and stuff parents aren't you know, aren't taking care of of their parental duties there's a lot of things opioids yeah, we, there's yeah kids to... dropping out and stuff like that absolutely all, there's a lot of reasons but you are you do see the more a whatever institution whatever you're dealing with whether it be an institution or whether it be corporations with their hr departments focusing on on like dei and stuff like that when you have the when you have those type of departments and that kind of focus you are taking away some of the at least a portion of the resources that are supposed to go to actually teaching and you're putting them to things that don't teach them or or hinder the, them teaching because if that were its own class in like whether it be social studies or whatever in civics or whatever, um, if the 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 type of of uh, you know awareness or social justice it was was its own class, that's one thing. But if you're mixing it in with other things, then you're going to have have a water you know, wow. have a problem with uh, this. Sorry, sorry, I think entertaining. You're making some uh, some some points that are understandable. However, the what those of us on the left are, are arguing that children should learn, for instance, our racial history in this country. Well, no one's arguing against that. Yes, many people are arguing against that. <laughs> they're, they're, I'm sorry, many people are arguing against that. And there's this hysteria about critical race theory, and they think just teaching people about the history of slavery in the United States. But that's States not true. Not that's, not critical, race. I mean, that's not critical race theory. Do you know that there are schools? There are schools. I remember I was in South Carolina, and there's a law that if any any child goes um, to the teacher and says that made me uncomfortable that then the teacher cannot teach that book. Yeah, and that came from the left because of people that, like, from, from microaggressions and stuff like that. If you feel uncomfortable in a, in a class, it was it was the left-leaning people that wanted... I kind of agree with that, actually. Yeah, there were the but left-leaning the people is, were like, go away. The point you know, is, a child, all that, that has to happen in that case is that the parents tell the child... Tell tell the teacher this makes you uncomfortable. Once a child gets into high school, you start reading books about things that, I mean, part of literature, part of art, part of movies. There are some things that are going to make you uncomfortable. They're, and if you're reading the history of the United out, States, though. some things right. let me, are let me, going let me, to make Do you agree with critical race theory? Critical race theory was just something that had to, it's so misunderstood. It was something that had to do with a legal theory that people were talking about in like law school. Um, you, but there are things that I, have to I, do. do, do you, just, are you not familiar with the the ideology of critical race theory? It has to do with the idea that many things are seen through and filtered through the the um, through the lens of of race. But many things that that parents have been lining up to complain about in um, in in school boards around the country just were anything that had to do with race and calling it. In, in this almost hysteria about critical race theory. I think there's a big difference between critical race theory and teaching children the truth about the history of the United States, which I believe, regardless of our politics, is a, is a requirement for conscious citizenship. So outside of perhaps there are a lot of ignorant people who aren't, they're complaining for a variety of reasons. I won't speak to them. I'm sure they exist. The political stances taken by uh, many people uh that were fighting books on critical race theory was what's called critical race praxis. And that is to take the ideology from Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell and apply it into schools through science and math and other subjects unrelated to, say, social studies. So you'd you'd end up with a lot of uh, uh, political commentators saying things like uh, my position, for instance, take the literal book, critical race theory, and bring it to any school you want and let children read it and even give them a lesson on it. But critical race praxis was when they did like a math problem. Like you were just talking about. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So the, the issue I take with critical race theory is that it is an abhorrent racist ideology that uh, advocates for segregation. And the critical race praxis was to take that ideology and apply it and teach children. We ended up with two, uh, uh, or I should say, 
we ended up with a wide range of extremist beliefs that we saw uh, manifest throughout the country, such as uh, what would they call it, non-POC and POC groups. They began actually creating uh, in Seattle, I think it was Seattle, there was a library where when people were allowed to come, if you were white, you had to go in a white room only. And if you were not white, you went to the not, not white room. In Dearborn, Michigan, you had the digital cafes. This was during, I believe it was during COVID. And they said, everybody come hang out online and talk in a chat room. But if you're white, you go in the room only for white people. And if you're not white, you go in the room only for not white people. For instance, uh, <clears throat> an example of this, Derek Bell, pioneer of critical race theory, actually argued that Brown should not have dismantled Plessy versus Ferguson. A core component of cri a critical race theory is that schools should remain segregated. So in, Sa I believe it was Sacramento School District, they created white racial affinity groups based on critical race theory. Okay. I, think, I think that should be a lot in schools. And if teachers are teaching critical race praxis to children, I believe it's illegal under the 1964 Civil Rights Act and should be barred from schools. Yeah. But what we end up with, once again, is you're banning books. Conservatives are banning books. They're trying to it's, stop teaching our it's history. It's realistic. But some of the books that they're banning, some of the books that they're banning, Grapes of Wrath. Yes, Grapes of Wrath is one of the uh, the top 100 uh, most uh, um, banned books. Grapes of Wrath, uh, the portrait of Dorian Gray, because someone has a homosexual feeling. Um or you were even talking about To Kill a Mockingbird. So I, I, I don't think we have to separate this. I mean, some things are just kind of outrageous, no matter what your politics are. But other things, I think American children should learn our history, and I think they should learn great great books of literature, great works of art. Um, I, th I think we all agree. Okay, good. So I we don't have to turn this into a war. But I think the issue is, if, say, Ron DeSantis comes out, and he put this on uh, FloridaGov.com, uh, or I should say they did. Actually, I think, no, this is uh, Ron DeSantis. The books they banned were Gender Queer Flamer, This Book is Gay, and Let's Talk About It, books that contained pornographic and adult materials and instruction on those things. But For junior high school? This is middle school. No, I wouldn't want that. But so the issue then becomes the, wi the media widely reports he's just banning books in general. When you get, I mean, this is, this is Ron DeSantis from his own mouth saying, these are the books we banned and why we banned them. But then all of a sudden, the corporate press just says he's banning books in general. And, and the conversation shifts from we don't want children getting access to adult content to the perspective which you have is, oh, they're trying to ban books Th like Grapes this of Wrath. Very... No, that's not, the persp uh, that's, not, that's not what I just said. I agreed with you that there are books that I would not, I don't, I'm not comfortable with the governor doing it, but there are books uh, with over sexual or whatever uh, at a certain young age that I just would be fine with the um, uh, with the school board saying um, too young. Yeah, this you is like um, like you were saying when you were younger, ideas of like racism were just shameful and that society wouldn't allow those things to get a mainstream megaphone. And now it's similar with books. We're in the age of self-publishing. People can can publish ideas without a central authority like saying hey that's a little like shape a publisher there's no gatekeeper yeah and so the idea that we kind of have to to be more vigilant in our censorship methods well, i think that, uh, that nothing no. is a substitute for an ethical revolution we all have to just uh, uh that's why the work of just what is an ethical person you can't there is no substitute for that I, I have I have a problem with with the the uh, your your talk of censorship just because it's one thing to to like I, we've talked about you know what can go into um, libraries and stuff and it's one thing to to curate what goes into school libraries and stuff like that censorship is a totally different animal I think it's a form of censorship wanna, curation and, well, like, I just okay. want to general no, I don't I mean a library curates an art director curates a, a Somebody curated what was on the wall here. Oh yeah, mostly me. Censor is mostly uh, a neutral term. It's just you're you're looking at something and deeming is this permissible or is it not in the current situation. No, I think I think curation is neutral. Censorship is not neutral. Well, you can censor something and allow it. So what you if you censor something, you're just deciding That's yes or censure no. Censure versus censor. Um, I think when you sense censoring is just the act of observing and deciding yes or no. Censoring is when you mm -hmm. make it's, it's it specifically off. removing yeah. information. It can be good or bad. I'm, but what I'm about curious. these great works of art? Uh, it, you were talking about the things you were talking about. Many of us are upset about things like To Kill a Mockingbird, Grapes of Wrath. Uh, but we all agree on that. Okay, you know, no and I think we all agree on a lot of stuff, yeah. But so this is this is more ambiguous. I'm curious your thoughts on this. It's kind of hard to read. I, I, I tried to find a higher resolution. Uh, and for the record, I was right. You were wrong. Censure <laughs> is uh, official rebuke or an expression like of strong disapproval. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a censor 
C-E-N-S-O-R is just the act of deciding yes or no. You can say yes, that's okay, but you still censored it. Or you can say, no, it's not okay, and you censored oh, it. I or is it a, it's sort of the, the opposite of what we are. Cinch, yeah, and so, I, so, so, sorry to interrupt. So, yeah. no, society's I, I, taken this. I think this, I understand what you're saying. They become, society will try and tell you that it means saying no. It only means saying no, but it's just the act of deciding yes or no. Is to censor. Yes. But by right, definition, if you say no, you are censuring. Uh, you Actually, could argue that, yeah. You said it's neutral, but I don't think it's neutral. There's a reason why it's censored. Um, um, I want to get, uh, uh, this is this is a more ambiguous example of from a book in a school. I'm curious your thoughts. Are you able to see it? Stop. I'm trying to find a good high resolution image of it, but this is from a book called Not My Idea, particularly a, a, a page from the book about contract binding you to whiteness. It says you get stolen land, stolen riches, special favors. Whiteness gets to mess endlessly with the lives of your friends, neighbors, and loved ones, and all fellow humans of color for the purpose of profit. Your soul, sign below. Land, riches, and favors may be revoked at any time for any reason. It depicts a uh, hoofed-footed demon with fire on top of um, with money on fire, a devil's tail, and a hand reaching for a handshake. No, I think that's terrible. So this is critical race praxis. When they take the ideology from Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw and they put it in a children's book, and this is one of the books they want removed from schools. Whiteness is a bad deal. It always was. Dude, we can see your pointy tail. This is what's in great schools. And this is this is the, the reason what, what, what why, like, this is the stuff that, that as much as conservatives are, are trying to get stuff out, and there there is going to be, or there are going to be attempts by um, more authoritarian conservatives to try and attach their, their limits on people's rights and stuff like that. That's gonna happen but at the same time stuff like this your average person doesn't even know like they're not even aware and then when it's presented to them by the media which you understand exactly how how duplicitous and 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 difficult it can be with today's modern media when it gets presented to the average person by the media th they do everything they can to make this seem like this isn't the situation they make it seem like it's ba it's all racist and all bigots and blah 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 but then you you actually look into it and the situation is no. There's really objectionable stuff being placed and put in schools that parents are objecting to, and then the FBI goes after the parents for protesting. You know, this is yeah, the, there this, was, is the, this is the government that that we have right now. This is the real federal government. FBI going after a parent because his kid was was well, this sexually is, this assaulted. Is state, this is state level. So in Virginia, uh, uh, Loudoun County. Are you familiar with the Loudoun County conflict, which been going? So Loudoun County is about thirty seconds from here, Loudoun County, Virginia. And there was a, uh, I believe she was a preteen girl, was raped in the bathroom by a boy wearing a dress. The conservative, uh, conservative center reported as a trans boy, but I don't think the boy was trans. I think the boy was like non-binary identifying or something, just wearing female clothes and using the girl's bathroom. The, fo the school covered it up. It led to a huge scandal, which was a huge component in why Northam didn't win re-election and why Youngkin did. Uh, the father got arrested when he went to the school board demanding to know why the school covered up the rape of his daughter. So these are the these are these are the extreme stories that are popping up for the people who are, you know, attuned to it. The corporate press, of course, is not talking about it. So, you know, I, I and think they slander I'll, people that do. Of course, like mm -hmm. I think much of what you experience, how they lie about you. It's so widespread. It's actually hard to break through. I did just bring up this site just to show you this. Not my idea that the passage I just showed you. This is a children's book where they say this about whiteness and uh I do want to talk about this, and, and this is, I don't know, I figure I'd bring this, this story up to see what your thoughts are. There's a movie coming out called The American Society of Magical Negroes. It's got people very angry because in the trailer for the film, they say, uh, actually, let me, let me see if I can just play this and I'll get your thoughts on it. Let's see if we have, uh, I might have to unmute the site. No, we're good. I know you can feel their discomfort, Aaron. Watching you walk through a room full of white people was the most painful thing I've ever seen. Excuse me, sorry. I don't want to take you to a job interview. There's a recruiting class starting right now and we got to get you in it. Welcome to the American Society of Magical Negroes. I don't really understand. It's easier to say. 
What's the most dangerous animal on the planet? Shark. Sure. White people, when they feel uncomfortable. White people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day. I'll pause right there and say, uh, show this, a meter showing white tears next to a police officer. So the premise of this film is that the most dangerous animal on the planet is white people. And a group of secret magical black people have to use magic powers to keep white people placated. Otherwise, the white people will turn on them and kill them. So this movie's got everybody pissed off. Uh, the Root wrote about it, and they're actually angry. Many, Well, I shouldn't say they're angry, but there's a lot of criticism from more of the left-leaning people that it depicts an interracial relationship, which is surprising. I guess not really. And then the criticism from the right is that the premise of the film is that white people are the most dangerous animal on the planet. This is what people would refer to as critical race praxis in mainstream media and film. And this is a ma this is a major movie. This is a, you know, Hollywood level production. One of the, the question that comes up for me is what you were saying before. Is it better that stuff be out there and that people hear it? You know? uh, I, personally, I think it's yeah. better, you know, um, but at the same time, like stuff like this, like this is 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 hidden from the public mm -hmm. and and until it it's burst into a, an ugly form like this and it that this book is, which the, one the, not my idea that book with the devil yeah telling that yeah. kid you know i mean it's mm -hmm. it's all it's all so toxic and so illiberal and there are people in and the media misrepresents all of the objections to mm -hmm. it as coming from a place of bigotry as coming from a place of evil and stuff and i can understand that it's so it's, so you know, I can understand that. This is why when it comes to a show like ours, we have every conservative in the world emailing us asking us to come on and not a single liberal emails emails us asking us to come on. We actively have to fight to get liberals well, come on the show. Wait a minute. Let's look at me. I'm I'm very left wing in my political views, but I agree with most of what that's you why you're sitting in this chair. Saying. I mean, this to me is it. So we're talking about a lot of things here that I don't even see as left right issues. I agree. But do you? They've but been so, turned so, into left right issues. But. And so the issue is when you have high profile, prominent liberal or leftist commentators who know exactly what we're talking about, they will not come on this show because they would have to put themselves in a position where they're in opposition to their tribe. Do you consider yeah, well, your... I, you know, my own tribe is not very nice to but me. But you see, that's exactly but... it. The yeah. people who are trying to remain within the circle of the, the dominant left ideology have to agree with critical race theory. And if they speak out against it, they will get canceled. They will get banned from media. They'll get lied about. They'll get smeared. You... Well, that's why I said earlier, if, if we could just stay away from that term. Uh, it, the the term is so is such a Which hot one? potato. It's not helpful. It's it's uh, it, what we're talking about here. It doesn't help to even talk about it in terms of critical race theory. It seems to me. But this is what critical race theory is. This is well, but it's but there are those who would argue differently. But they're, they're wrong. Well, so, well, so this is critical we, race it, practice. This is practice. But but more more importantly, when like we have the book, we have uh, Chris, Kimberly Crenshaw's book, Critical Race Theory: The Core Ideology. And it explicitly talks about what the ideology means, what it represents, what their goals are. Derek Bell, of course, famously said he thought Plessy v. Ferguson was wrong and he wants segregation in schools. So when someone comes out and says, I would argue critical race theory is something different, they are lying. Do you, there's two things that, that I- They could be wrong too, but anyone arguing in favor of segregation, I think is, is doing bad. First of all, I, I wonder, do you consider yourself a liberal or do you consider yourself a progressive? Well, this is what I feel. I feel everybody needs to come out of their silos right now. Okay. I, I think these, these, these labels are not helping any of us. I don't even think they help us at this table. I think this table has been an example of the, the labeling is the one places <clears throat> where we've gotten off. And when we didn't have the labels, we were just talking as Americans. And I say that all the time. You know, I'm running for president, and I, and I feel that so strongly. People say, who do you talk to? I don't give a different talk depending on if they're black, brown, white, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, gay, straight, non-binary, rich, poor. I'm speaking to a place in the American heart, the American conscience, American decency. And I think all of those labels are disserving us right now. I, so on a, on, a, on a superficial level, I'm a progressive, but I see stuff now that just makes me think 
nobody has a monopoly on truth and nobody has a monopoly on this smugness and arrogance and my way is right and your way is wrong. This almost mean-spiritedness that I see in everyone right now and I think we all need to get off our high horses. I think, uh, I agree. I think the issue is, you know, for us, for instance, it comes down to the uh, simplification of terms and their general understanding. So we end up in this world where I am a, I, I, when I was younger, I was a punk rock anarchist skateboarder uh, listening to, you know, anti-flag and bands like that. Against me, baby, I'm an anarchist. I can still play that song and I still know all the words. <laughs> and uh, now they call me far right. So I still wear the same clothes. I don't think of you, I mean, just hearing you today. I mean, I don't know. Well, I don't watch your show all the time. Because they're lying, right? <laughs> well, but they, they lie do. about me all the time. Too, exactly. So. so they'll lie and they'll say, I'm a conservative. <laughs> Despite the fact that my politics are actually fairly middle of the road, yeah. you know, I, I have I have arguments with pro life individuals on a more traditionally Democrat pro choice position. But that's it, what I mean. Let's drop the let's drop the labels. Aren't helping us. Right yeah, now. getting people locked into to boxes and silos of what they think they are. I think that's a tactic used by people that want to maintain control of a society. And they also are creating an artificial dichotomy as a as a kind of screen to hide the real division. The real division is the powerful versus the powerless. The real division is the corporate elite versus those struggling to get by. Agreed. The real division is those who have capital and access to more capital versus those who are locked into circumstances uh, that deny them the opportunity for economic growth. This is but there is an Occupy Wall Street, man, Tim. You brought it up multiple times. They It was working. Occupy was working. And Bank of America was shaking. And then all of a sudden... You start to see identity politics. They wouldn't let me speak because I was white. They said, yep. you can't. We've had too many white people. I was like, I'm about to read the Constitution. Doesn't and they matter. wouldn't. That's, it, that made it worse. And they were like, <laughs> oh, what well, guy read the Constitution? I was sure. No, can was, do. Was there sad. is another component to this. Uh, I agree with you on the corporate elite and those who struggle. But then there is the international versus nationalist view where you appear to be more of the internationalist sentiment. And Trump supporters appear to be more of the nationalist sentiment. And what, what I mean by that is... Yeah, you're right. I am yeah. Nationalism is not a good thing. The one thing to love your country, patriotism is a good thing. Thinking your country is better and the only one that matters is not a good well, thing. Well, that's not nationalism. I mean, that, that, there, there, perhaps there's a, there's a better word for that. I think maybe chauvinism, which I, uh, uh, used to be like uh, bias for males or something, but now is typically represent... Re, 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 actually, no, I think chauvinism was originally you're boastful about your own country. But uh, to clarify what I mean, uh, Trump supporters love America, and many of them will say we're the best country ever. Well, we love America. Right. But so for me, for instance, uh, I don't want foreign war. I don't think we should be sending money to Ukraine. I don't think we should be engaged in the Middle East and Syria. I don't think we should be uh, occupying Afghanistan. We shouldn't have for as long as we did. It's a disaster. Iraq, all of the same. Now you've got Lindsey Graham calling for war in Iran. All that's bad. I don't think we should have economic hitman going to South America. I think we should have uh, legal immigration. Everybody in the world can come here, but you got to come here through a process so we can make sure the economy is functioning and everyone's happy. I think we should have manufacturing brought back. I think that we should stop uh, sending our jobs and our factories overseas through failed trade policies, help the American worker, help the, uh, uh, you know, your, your average working class individual. But that also means we can't just have porous borders with 10,000 people coming in every single day that negatively impacts the people all over this country. And, and we can see they're angry over it. Where I come from, everything you just said was moderate. And many things that you just said that I definitely think of myself as left wing agree with. For some reason, the media calls me far right, huh? Pardon? The media calls me well, far right. Well, they call me kooky crazy. You know? <laughs> well, that's the thing. They're lying yeah, about exactly. everything. This nationalism. They decide where they want to put. I kind of decide I'm not really a nationalist. I mean, reading what it actually means is the yeah. ideology that says that the individual's loyalty and devotion to the nation state surpasses the individual's other groups or interests. So well, like it's, it's your like family, JFK. your your local community should be the most and important the rest thing of, to you. Yeah, or the rest of the world. No, but I don't, I don't. God like created that. all men equal. Our Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. And that's not just all Americans are created equal. All men are created equal. But that's that, that's this, our this, mission statement. This is correct. And non-citizens who are in this country, like a tourist is a good example, have constitutional protection, same as any other person, whether yeah. they're a citizen or not. Uh, I suppose the, the, the challenge then becomes, I think it's fair to say that American classically and traditionally liberal uh, worldviews don't align with, say, like fundamentalist Islam. Yes, correct. But if we have a porous border where 10,000 people are coming in every day, 
eventually you end up with communities that are overwhelmingly fund- fundamentally Islamic and will pass laws that say uh, result in female genital Sharia mutilation. Law. Right. And we see this. We see this in, in, in parts of the country. That's my concern about immigration. We want people to come here and integrate with the policies and the plans that have worked and helped so many people. But if immigration is unchecked, you'll end up with uh, um, you end up with what, what's the, what's the right word? Um, Sharia law. No, no, no. Uh, isolated districts that operate unanimously. So enclaves. Enc- enclave is yeah. a good word for rather it. than when our grandparents, like my cram- grandparents, were eager to assimilate. Right. The, and the also term assimilation has the, has kind of become like a, see, an ugly word to it or an ugly tone to it nowadays. Where people the way I look at way. this, this conversation. That one right there, for instance, should be a conversation that we should be able to have without anybody feeling like I have, uh, you know, there are, there's a yin and a yang here. Yeah. There's a yin and a yang here. You know, uh, President Eisenhower said, the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. <clears throat> there are high-minded liberal views and there are high-minded uh, conservative views. And, and I, I think it's important that we remember nobody owes it to you to agree with you. Nobody has a monopoly on truth. And a lot of things can be true at the same time. That's how I feel about the conversation we had about the books in, in, in um, middle school. That's the uh, same to me about some of the racial things you were talking about and the things we're talking about now. Many things are true at the same time. And the point, the, the founder's vision was that if we do talk about it, we're all educated, uh, we're all <laughs> thinking, it's what's happened is this character logical way that we all jump to a conclusion, jump to an alignment with a kind of knee jerk um, identification with what we think our side is supposed to think, and that's what's taking us down. We should we should be able to discuss these things just listening to each other. Sometimes we want to rush to what is the answer, and sometimes the answer is just the quality of how we think about the question, and how we just ponder. And reflect, well, that was right, this is right, true. What he said was true. What I just said is true. Both are true. That's this is called what we maturity. Tried to do. That's called maturity. Let's go to uh, a very difficult subject. A what? Let's go to a very difficult subject. Abortion. All right. Uh, so have on your uh, website here, this is Marianne2024.com, 100% pro-choice. Uh, do you want to just break down for us what your view is on abortion, what it should be, <clears throat> access, I think abortion is a moral issue. But I think it is a moral issue that is between a woman and her conscience, the God of her understanding. Um, I believe it is an issue of private morality and not public morality. Uh, Traditionally in this country, uh, the divide between right and left, people on the right concern themselves more with issues of private morality, people on the left issues of public morality. Like uh, that's why you find people on the right talking about abortion, talking about homosexuality, People on the left talking about economic justice is a moral issue. Invading a country that didn't do anything uh, to you is a moral issue. It's kind of inverted now, though. Well, the Democrats are pro, you know, funding for Ukraine and well, but see, the Republicans I think are anti-intervention. More, but see, me, even that, that's a comp. Can we just get more real and more deep about it rather than seeing it, it? They're doing it with Israel and Palestine, too. Everything people are trying to make everything black and white. now. Well, you said Republic, the, the right tends to do this. The left tends to do that. And I but would say a lot of that specific issues. I didn't mean. But are we going to stay with abortion? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. I just feel I trust the uh, moral decision making of the American woman. And I don't think a government has any right to tell a woman what to do with her body. Do you think there should be any limits on uh, the amount of like how many weeks before? Yeah. And the states came up with those limits. And that's why I think what we had with Roe v. Wade was reasonable. So uh, in your view... Do you, do you think it should be a federally legislated or codified issue pertaining to abortion that should affect all states? Like uh, Roe v. Wade, for instance, was overturned. As president, would you advocate for or sign a bill that would federally codify Roe v. Wade? Yes. Do you think that there should be uh, limits? Uh, how, how do you phrase this properly? Should there be a time limit, like after 16 weeks or 20 weeks? Well, there weeks? always was. There was. There was. But do you think there should be now? Is there, is yes, there a certain except of- when, yeah, Yes, except when the health of the health of when health issues of health are involved. So, so uh, let's say there's no issue of health. 
a woman is pregnant, would it be, what, what's, it, what's your view, 16 Listen, weeks, they, 20 when weeks? When people start talking about this late-term abortion thing, you've got, no, do I think someone, who, a, a woman who's eight months pregnant, just decides, you know, I don't want to do this, should she be able to have an abortion? No, but that doesn't happen. So then would you have an issue with it being made illegal? Well, it, it was during the, during when Roe v. Wade was legal, that was not possible. The states had the states had their 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 limits. If if a Republican Congress said, OK, it never happens, we're going to ban all abortions after six months. No, we- because you've got to keep it with medical. I mean, will you see what's happening with Kate Cox in Texas now? <clears throat> I don't think a government should get between a, a, a woman and medical decisions. This is the first I've heard of Kate Cox. Tell me about it. I think Tim's looking it up right now. Yeah, Texas Tribune. Kate Cox's case reveals how far Texas intends to go to enforce... There's in- judges saying what that woman has to do and she has to leave Texas to get a, an abortion that was necessary and that was uh, for her health and for her the, the viability of her uh, being, a, being fertile in the future. Ah, uh, yes. But this was, I believe, the Supreme Court ruled the doctor did not demonstrate a medical need. The doctor... The doctor... That's... The... Uh, uh, a bunch of men who are judges in Texas should not be determining what the doctor calls medical need and what the doc- what the doctors were claiming was that her future fertility was at stake. Yeah. So yeah, and, and that's the, the, not for a bunch of judges in Texas to say you therefore have not demonstrated med- medical need because they don't consider that a medical issue. And then this is what kills <clears throat> me. Why it, it, most of my conservative friends say we don't want government overreach. To me, that's extraordinary government overreach. That was an issue about that woman and her medical care. And those I agree. The old men and and on some court in Texas saying that's not. I wouldn't. Oh. I wouldn't go that far, but I do. I do uh, think when it comes to medical issues, it, it's being debated right now. Conservatives saying it's a tri, uh, tr, uh, trisomy eighteen or something like that. I, I'm I'm not familiar with the uh, uh, the ailment of the child, and they're concerned that it could uh, negatively impact her uh, fertility, and the child may not even live that long. There's a possibility the child could live long, but not. They're not sure. And so th- that's 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 a very it, it is a tough moral position. I don't I that's tough for me. That's tough for I, me. I just don't. To me, it's not even tough. To me, it's government get your hands out of this. But let's 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 go back because I'm gonna I'm gonna press you on this. If the Republicans said, if you think late term abortion elective late term abortion never happens, then how about we have a ban? Elective abortion after six months is hereby made illegal. But they that that. Is already under under Roe v. Wade. That was already true. Under Roe v. Wade, that was already true. The states had uh, their limits, and then beyond that, there had to do with with uh, what a doctor had to say. Sure, but is that is yes? You would agree with a law banning abortion, elective abortion after six months? I, I don't want to give you the set time frame. You can choose whatever time frame you want. After after certain t- uh, after certain period of time, yeah. My concern is with um, the definition of uh, of what it means to be a medical issue. And how do we, how do how do how do we protect against abuse of the system? I've never been been one to say that potential crimes of an individ, individual should then in, uh, infringe upon someone else's rights for say like medical care. And I'm not talking about elective abortion. I'm saying, you know, if a woman has a very serious disease and is going to hemorrhage or something, and the doctor's like, "Ma'am, you're not going to make it. We have to operate now." I think it's absurd to be like, "But that would abort the baby." So we got to talk to a judge or something. The concern there, however, is. There have been instances where people have tried to argue mental health qualifies and have tried to use that to get elective abortion. It may be rare, but this is the concern conservatives have and pro-life individuals have is preventing abuse of the system and abortion as contraception. No matter what law you pass, there's going to be abuse of the system. I agree. Yeah. So that's not a reason not to pass a good law. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. I think uh yeah, the, the idea that some people will break the law means that everyone must now abide by this uh, a harsh exactly. standard doesn't necessarily solve the problem. No, that's ridiculous. But there are concerns, for instance, in Colorado, the new law now, and I understand what you're saying about Roe v. Wade. Currently, uh, abortion in Colorado is one of seven states without any term restrictions as to when a pregnancy can be terminated. It is uh, colloquially described as uh, re- restrictionless and limitless abortion, meaning a woman could be without many, any medical health issue and at nine months and legally get an abortion and 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 to the point of birth. So uh, the famous example of this was when um, uh, I think it was Rep Tran, I could be getting her name wrong, in Virginia argued to a judge that a baby could be at the point of birth 
and the doctor could terminate the life of the baby under Virginia's bill. The bill didn't pass. Uh, Governor Northam got in a lot of heat over this. I think I actually have the, the story. Yeah, this is right here. It's from 2019. Virginia governor faces backlash over comments supporting late-term abortion bill where, whether intentionally or not, he actually described post-birth abortion, which is not a real thing, but he basically described just killing the baby. In his statement on radio, he said the baby would be delivered, resuscitated, and then they would decide if they would like to terminate. Oh, come on. He did say that, yes. But yeah, but that does not. That, and he said it's not a real thing. Well, no, no, no. Post, post-birth abortion is just killing a baby. Yeah. So, but that's what Northam actually advocated for. Well, it's absurd. So this, this is, this issue like this comes up in the press and just like all the other issues, you'll end up with me like, you know, traditional liberal, fairly pro-choice, but like, I think there should be safe, legal, rare. And you see a story like this and I'll say, okay, this man's lost his mind. You got to vote him out of office. Then the media claims he never said it. They claim it's a lie. They say, nobody wants this. It never happens. And we're sitting here like we got the guy on his his audio of him. Uh, basically, uh, he says they're done in cases where there may be severe deformities. I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physician and the mother. Oh, so they're talking about severely deformed babies. It, we, we can I will give him all of the benefit of the doubt and everything and we will say the most deformed a baby could be he's still talking about after it's already born and alive bring it to another room and then talking with the doctor whether you want to end its life it's a question of you know to what degree do we accept deformities to be terminated after birth right i mean this is his quote cnn has it uh you know what is what is uh, uh severe deformity defined as legally i mean is down syndrome considered that to that degree oh god no but I mean, uh, one of the most common forms of reasons for abortion is the baby is diagnosed with Down syndrome. But you know, now we have sonograms and we have, um, what is that other one called? Uh, not sonogram. The, the, they know so much now. Do you, like in, in, in your opinion, if a woman found out that her, uh, her healthy, viable pregnancy, the child had Down syndrome, do you think that's reason for an abortion? I would have the child. I would have a, uh, I would have a Down syndrome child. <laughs> If Do, I found out I had Down syndrome. But should it be legally allowed for a woman to terminate a pregnancy that is otherwise healthy if the child has Down syndrome? To me, the issue of abortion, whether a, whatever the woman's decision has to do with the time and what that state determines as the time. So that is the reason. And then her reasoning <clears throat> is her reasoning. So any reason? No reason at all? Until a certain period of time. Right, right, no. So, like, look, I, Once a child is viable, and this is obviously a baby, they could be delivered and live, that's a whole different thing. I completely agree. The argument we've, we've run into with progressives is they actually go beyond that. Uh, even a friend of mine argued that a child, uh, uh, a baby is not alive until it's delivered. Therefore, a baby at nine months could be aborted if the woman well, wants. Well, I don't agree with that. A lot of the progressives, and it's not a lot, mind you, but a yeah, couple. Yeah, I know. I See, this is where we... this. This only bolsters and fortifies this separation. Well, no, I think this is healing. That. Huh? I think this is healing. That's why I asked. Yeah. Uh, hearing, <laughs> hearing from you, someone who's running for, for uh, the Democratic Party saying we don't want these things is exactly what I hope. It I, is I, a moral issue. Of I, course, it's a moral issue. This but is what I, we need. We I need. support Roe v. Wade. And I think a woman's right to abortion should be codified by law. And I would do everything. The idea of a government telling a woman uh, what she has to do is very difficult for me. When I was, uh, uh, when the Roe v. Wade decision came out, I was more on the side of perhaps it's good the states can figure out for themselves and have more nuanced laws. But now I don't know if I'm for Roe v. Wade, but I am certainly for the federal uh, legislation and adjudication of when a, a baby has constitutional rights. So uh, I believe life begins at conception. However, I'm much more libertarian on the issue, which is why I'm concerned about having to go to a doctor or a panel of judges to determine medical issues. It's, it's tough. I don't, I don't have a good answer. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, I just lost my train of thought. We are, we're coughing. having a lot of, we're hearing everything that we said would happen with Dobbs is already happening. Great suffering among women. You know, women used to have, you know, when I was growing up, it was simply before, before Roe v. Wade, um, and I think I was a little girl at the time, but certainly before it was uh, legal, it was about rich women getting safe abortions and poor women getting unsafe abortions. I remember what I was going to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
I believe the federal government and the Supreme Court needs to issue a ruling on when life begins. They have to. Because the 14th Amendment, under its basic reading, I believe, protects the constitutional rights of the unborn. It says no person, it does not say citizen, shall have their rights infringed without due process. But if we were to interpret that verbatim, textually, that would mean that a, if a baby is viable, then only through adjudication in a court could the woman seek abortion, even if it was for medical reasons. Yeah, this says uh, in le well, a legal if it was person for medical yeah. is uh, someone that can do things a human person is usually able to do in law. So a baby wouldn't, I mean, an infant in the womb wouldn't be a person if they can't do any, you know. You got to be able to do then, things that then, a human can do. But then that hey, means that like- a seven-month-old baby, a seven- Yeah, like, it just- It doesn't do, have- I mean- it, I'm sorry to interrupt. Born babies are persons. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in womb, in utero, it doesn't have legal personhood yet because it doesn't have the ability to do things that a person would do. Eat, I don't know. Cry, that, that, but that's know, not been adjudicated. Right. That's your opinion. That's just and my argument. That's is my, the Supreme is my Court, opinion. You're right. And the Supreme Court needs to rule on their opinion as to when they actually would. That, that's my point. Legal personhood for babies in utero. That'd be well, interesting. Well, if, if, if there's a baby that's nine months gestated in the womb and a baby that's nine months gestated that's already been delivered, you cannot say that they are different biological entities. The only thing that's different is the layer of flesh His between them. the birth itself. You know, Roe v. Wade was working. Roe v. Wade was working. I I disagree. Clearly, when you look at conservatives and the outrage and the sentiment, it wasn't working for them. I always felt like that was a well, minority. You could say that. I mean, a lot of people. Slavery was working for a lot of people. But the but, the, but actually, <laughs> it was the, a lot of people were against civil rights legislation. I mean, only the, only what? I think five percent of the country had slaves. So the abortion majority wasn't of people were just for like the babies that were getting and, aborted either. Just like slavery wasn't working for the slaves, abortion's not working for the babies that are getting aborted. So you don't think that uh, abortion should be legal under any circumstances? I'm pro-choice to the, for the first pr first trimester. And then at the end of the first trimester, no, my, my argument is more so if the baby can survive on its own, you shouldn't kill it. That's a tough argument because if you don't have electricity, <laughs> unless there's medical. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then my concern is like, I, I agree with you. I think the idea that a doctor says to you like, Hey, you're about to die. Better call the judge and get an emergency. Oh, writ. That's, horrifying. Well, that's just insane. I mean, but the, I, I suppose if the Supreme court ruled on the 14th amendment that the unborn are legal persons, because if if a baby is born premature at what what's the, what's the earliest they 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 can be they they've gone now it's like thirty weeks or something I don't Seamus knows way better than me but twenty six weeks twenty six right something like that is that a illegal person it is uh, so if a baby is born as premature as premature can be and it is alive and you kill it you will be charged was, with with murder generally between twenty three and twenty four weeks and you know that like right now they have the technology to do uh, artificial wombs. They've raised, you know, they've they've gestated lambs in yeah, an artificial. That's the thing. Just because they can take your three week old fetus and make it gestate in a tube doesn't mean it's like a viable. Yes, it yeah, does. But, but, it, but the power goes. But hold out. on, I'm not even arguing. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. A premature child it can be put in a safe place where it survives on its own. You got, you got to feed it and everything, but a premature baby is a legal person. Yeah, it has the protections of personhood. The only difference between the, a baby six months that was born premature and a baby six months still in the womb is the layer of flesh between it's it. It's the birth itself. In which case, I'm, I, it's I, just I, actually, I actually think the Supreme Court we currently have may, may argue the 14th Amendment protects the due process rights of the unborn after viability, which is not too dissimilar from Roe v. Wade. But this results in after 16 weeks or maybe 20, a woman who wants an abortion for any reason, even medical, the, would have to go through a due process system. Uh, no, uh, I just don't think the government should be involved there. I suppose the issue is the due process rights of persons. Uh, uh, you know, and if not, if, if, a, if a baby after six months is considered a person, if it's outside the womb, then why wouldn't it be inside the womb? And then does a doctor have the right to kill someone without due process? A, a doctor takes a Hippocratic oath. A doctor is not who who says to who suggests such. Uh, well, the baby procedure. has to die in the abortion. But the, if the doctor is suggesting that procedure, there is some medical reason having to do with the mother or the child. Well, I agree with you, right? And so, in this circumstance, <clears throat> man, excuse me, frog in my throat. Imagine there's a woman who's six months pregnant. The baby is is viable, can survive on its own. The woman. The doctor says there is an issue where if you continue this pregnancy right now, 97% chance you die in a, in, in, in a week. 
we need to abort now, otherwise you will die. The baby can survive. You will die. But no, if this, if that baby, that baby could be de- delivered right now. I mean, why couldn't the baby be delivered right now? Well, I agree then. In which case, we would say no and to the so abortion. So then you're saving the baby and you're saving the mother. I, I, it's interesting because I think you, you actually agree 80% with many of our pro-life friends. Yeah, that, th- I feel that way about so many things. Right. And we, it's we just... divide. The media divide I'm, creates hyper-polarized views of what it well, should it's be. Not it's just not just the, just the media, media who does it. It's it's <laughs> not just the media who does it. No, it's the activists too, I think. I yeah, agree. I totally, exactly. I totally agree with you. Because, because the, the, what we're, cause what, really what, what it boils down to, we are talking about you know f- the edges here when it comes to, you know, most abortions are a form of birth control. Most abortions happen early, um, the majority of. But then when you start talking to like, you know, partial birth abortions or whatever, they are the the edge cases. And so they're they're... It's not the, the the primary concern. These things tend to come up when you're dealing with political conversations. More, you know, and, there's and, another and thing about agree social on more, media. More I'm just to... thinking, I would bet you that somebody's going to take something I say here to, said here tonight. Oh, yeah. I'm just sure of it. <laughs> I was saying, thinking, my God, this is why people said, don't. you know, they're going to take you, one you sentence no out of context. This is why. Well, they're going to show me agreeing with Tim Pool about something <laughs> out of context. And oh, my God, look, oh, God. she's one of them. I mean, there's already this 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 meme about me that actually I'm a, a Christian Republican. And I, I'm some kind of mole or something, <laughs> you know. This, um, this is why liberals and that, don't. that's a large part of the problem. And that's also social media did that. You know? this, this I mean, why... somebody did that with Israel and Palestine for me the other night. One sentence out of context and then uh, but, one so, slip of the tongue or one, you know, like, well, we misspoke that one word and you're, you know, you're dead in the water politically. Yeah, the, so so the we're on the other side of the fire. And media. this is, this is why many liberals don't want to come on the show. Yeah. Because they know. I understand now. <coughs> they have to tell the line. <laughs> like, you can't but, say, no, I didn't say it. It just doesn't work. You got to keep making media. Keep doing it to to, no, that's, that's, to that's, that's, reinforce who you are. That's the, I believe that's the way to counteract spin. It's it's actually, it, you can't counteract spin. You can't really ever counter. Well, you can you can diminish it by making your own media and being I in control really, of your own I platform. I think about that a lot. That So the issue with spin is that the corporate press will always do what it does. They are interested in either their political narrative or their clicks. And what clicks will they get from saying Marion Williamson gives reasonable view on moderate position? Nothing. It's they- not just the corporate press either. Because sometimes what I've seen in my life with all this is the corporate press will say it, but people who like to think of themselves as sophisticated and invulnerable to social, me- uh, social media manipulation are so vulnerable to it. They'll see one anonymous tweet or one article on the internet as though, oh, well, then that's true. Yep. Um, it's just so debased, our level of, of public dialogue. And what's wrong with, we don't, why do we all have to agree on every little thing? We don't. And I, I see in politics, I, I see, I have never voted for anyone expecting that I agreed with them on everything. I've never voted for anyone expecting that during their term in office, they would agree with me on everything. We're living at a time when you have to line up. And if you don't, if you agree on any little thing, or like we were just talking about, somebody will take something, a clip on the, on the, you know, like I could be tonight, right? I could hear tomorrow from my team. It went viral. A million people saw you say something out of context. It's But that, this, my advice would just be, Screw those people. Well, which is which is when you're not running for office. This has certainly been my feeling. I mean, I'm an author, but it's sad for politics because oh, yeah. it, it keeps it keeps people of nuance and and deeper reflection. So this is sort of it, it disqualifies you. This is why my view is just good versus evil. When someone, a parent, sees a book with a blowjob in it, given to their kids stonewall honor book and being given to middle schoolers and that parent says you know i take issue with this and they go to the school board and they say i don't know why you have this book in the curriculum i don't think it's appropriate for children then all of a sudden you get a wave of activists in the media lying about what happened those are evil people the people who lie about you and misrepresent you i believe that's evil they are they are causing damage and destruction to this country they are harming you who, uh, you know, obviously you're trying to do good. You're trying to help people. You're trying to be a good person. We respect it tremendously. But the media thinks you're a threat to their power. I shouldn't say the media, but 
elements of the political establishment. Political media industrial complex. I Absolutely. I think these people are evil. I find the good and evil thing to even be too polarizing. It's, but it is evil. It's just a simplification method to divide people because we all have it within us. We can all turn on a dime. We could yes, stay but with right and wrong. Given that there is evil in the world, and I do believe there's evil in the world, I, I agree with you that we could, even though, believe me, I'm watching it, I'm living it right now, I'm living it with the way the... Uh, the corporatized political party system is, you know, keeping me out of the conversation, planting stories, uh, right. planting people in your t all, all of that. I see it as wrong. I don't see it as evil. I see it as evil. I mean, look, uh, I think you are a good person. We we uh, in twenty twenty you are in twenty nineteen the primaries and everything we 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 watched you uh, we had Michael Malice here yesterday who said that he thinks you're so wonderful and fantastic you've helped so many people and the media lies about everything yeah. we we none of us here or any of our friends have any issue with disagreeing with you we think we disagree we, we do I, we, you mm -hmm. know Ian and I disagree all the time let's get mm -hmm. to it but so here's my issue I don't think I'm right about everything I certainly think I'm right about a lot but I think I'm wrong about a lot too and so what I think goodness would be is recognizing that. There's a strong possibility I'm wrong about everything. Therefore, the best outcome for the people of this country, for the world, for the working class, and even the wealthy. We want everyone to succeed and, and, and strive. And uh, uh, this means we must be as honest as we can, advocate for what we believe, and represent the positions of others as best we can. So if you tell me your position on you know, abortion or race or whatever, I want to make sure I have it exactly as you're, you're saying it. We'll, 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 we'll break down the, the core argument. Let the people hear it. And then they can say, you know what, Marion's actually right about that. I agree. Because then they can make better decisions, which a rising tide lifts all ships. What we're seeing with the political, what did you call it? The political media uh, industrial complex. And it is that. What they're saying is, I don't care if she's right. I deserve the power. So lie. That's exactly correct. Trick people into giving us the power and we'll do what we want because we're smarter than you. That's that is That is totally correct. I, you know. Now, just to clarify, because I'll clip you. I said I say that's evil. You said they're doing wrong. I think it is evil for someone to trick people into stealing power. Well, let's talk about it in terms of the foundational principles of the United States. We could stay away from right and wrong, good and evil, and go right to undemocratic. It is an assault and an undermining of democracy. So I think, you know, the founders, and, and I've heard you, actually, I heard a clip of you the other day, because I said, oh, I'm going to look at a little bit before I go on his show and you were talking about and you were talking about the declaration of independence and first principles and total agreement so the founders did not expect that we would come to the quote unquote right decision every time but as jefferson said the only safe repository for power is in the hands of the people yeah so the whole idea of public education the whole idea of free speech the whole idea of a free press the whole idea of us freedom of assembly was so that we could discuss things that we would have critical uh, thought processes that were that were educated. And so what the founders said is, if that's the case, and we really have the right to discuss these things, more often than not, the truth will out. There's something so profound about that. So this corporatized media and, and, and social media um, uh, suppression oh, of yeah. truth, smearing of people, mischaracterizing people, and believe me, I don't think anybody knows it more than I do, actually, oh, yeah. is a way of suppressing the democratic process. Agreed. I'm concerned about the public school because you were saying education is key, but like this John Dewey, Rockefeller public school thing that got built in like the late 1910, 1910. Yeah, that's not the Founding Fathers' uh, vision of it's how like, education would happen. It creates uniformity of thought. It doesn't build critical well, thinking necessarily. It creates, it creates centralization of doc, of indoctrination. Well, it was a post-industrial thing. It was yeah. really creating workers more than creating yep. critical thinking. The bell thinkers. rings. What does the shift more? change? What's the best way to create critical thought? They even look thought? like factories right. and prisons. <laughs> how do you inspire critical thinking? Great teaching. Great teachers. That's why I have so much respect for teachers. We are going to go to Super Chats and uh, take some questions. So if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Head over to TimCast.com if you want to watch the <coughs> members-only uncensored show where we will have guests call in and ask some questions. And don't forget to go to TheBestSongEver.com. Click download your price, 69 cents or whatever you want to give, and you can buy the song to help support our work and our cultural endeavors. It is it. This is the final, final run. It's the home stretch. 
we if everybody bought that song right now we would shatter our way into the hot 100 so um if you want to support us that's how you do it otherwise you know feel free not to but i asked what can i say all right let's, let's grab some super chats we got clint torres says howdy people dearest chat i must leave you why i cannot say where you cannot know how long will i be there i haven't decided but the one thing i can tell you is that anytime you hear the wind blow it will whisper the name tim cast and so let us part with a love that will echo through the ages it's, see you later clint that is one hell of a super <laughs> chat i Kudos, think that's a quote man. from something it's what is it from oh, no, it's oh. Two. it's two two super chats so. raymond g stanley jr says tim now that these now that those people polled and the media readers will be like who's tim pool and why would would he be influential it'll expand the reach of you and jack so uh this organization i i'm being told it's like affiliated with ron DeSantis's campaign or not his campaign is super PAC. they did a poll and they, they wrote this story up saying, uh, poll finds Tim Pool and Jack Posobiec are not influential. And I'm just like, now hold on there, gosh darn minute. Why would you write a story about two people you think are unknowns with no influence? Who's going to click the story? Imagine if someone wrote a story and said, you know, John Aaron Ferguson and Bill Dershley are not influential. You'd be like, who? Like, why would you click it? Right. But I will say the funny thing is, is what Raymond's referencing. The poll actually found, and this is wild, despite the fact they're saying no one knows who Tim Pool is and he's not influential, the poll found one in three people are familiar with me, which is freaky. So I think the poll's probably bunk, but it certainly did not produce the results they were trying to claim it did. Yeah, they, they said it's like 69% were unfamiliar with Pool. I'm like, 31% of people you asked knew who I was? That's crazy. Why did DeSantis care if you're in? What was that about? Why well, I don't know about him personally, <clears throat> but uh, we we are um, not fans of the DeSantis campaign and his staffers and his surrogates. I think they are just despicable people. Absolutely hey, despicable. Speak for yourself. You said we. I don't know him personally. I'd like to meet. <clears throat> I'm talking Christ about his campaign. We got to have Christina Pasha on here to defend That'll herself because I am not happy the way that no, she ran no. DeSantis's campaign. You know what? I'd like to we, talk to her we, to her face. We invited her before, but I think she's made it clear as to why she shouldn't be on the show. And it's because like, you know, sometimes we do want to get some fans to call into the show, but we don't do full two hour segments where we just invite some random person off the street to come and talk politics. We usually try to find someone who has a body of work in some way. You don't have to have a million followers. Some people come on the show, they have like 3,000, you know, or, or none at all, don't even have a social media account, but they're doing something relevant work. Christina Pasha views herself as just a fan of, of politics. She's on Twitter and fl having flame wars with like random Twitter accounts. Get out here, Christina. Nah, nah I'm not, I'm not interested in, in grabbing a random flame war Twitter account and having them come on the I'm show. I'm very disappointed in the way his campaign was run. I will admit that. Basically, they're, they're this is what they do. They lie. Like the idea that uh, a, a, a polling agency affiliated with his PAC would make some ridiculously stupid story saying Tim Pool's not influential. It's just the like stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, because like I was saying, media I published a story saying poll finds Tim Pool is not influential. Well, then why would anyone click the story? Who wants to read about a guy they never heard about for no reason to find out a guy they don't know about has no relevance? How many people did they pull for that? I don't even know. But like the point is, would you read an article that says poll finds John <laughs> Ferguson does not is not known by you? You'd be like, yeah, you're correct. Yeah, they used your name on purpose because they knew it would get clicks. Exactly. So which which means... contradicts the poll. And the poll found that one in three people actually do know who I am. That's kind of insane to think about. And they frame it as though Republicans don't trust Tim Pool. I'm not a Republican. I don't like Republicans either. Why are they making this fake this fake story? So what happens is you have uh, uh, Trump gets kicked off the ballot in Colorado. Actually, real quick, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree with Trump? Um, being what it, uh, oh, the thing about the Supreme, the court yeah. saying he can't be on the ballot. Yeah, I think, and certainly, I disagree with uh, Trump politically. I, I have a extreme disagreements, but he has not been convicted of insurrection, and I Agreed. think that what is better for everyone is that Donald Trump is uh, uh, given a fair, fair treatment before the law. Completely, that's what agree. I believe. So what happens with the DeSantis camp is the Vivek Ramaswamy says, I will withdraw from the primary unless they allow Donald Trump to be involved. Ron DeSantis was asked, would you also withdraw? And he says, no, I earned the delegates. This is how it's played. And I intend to win. But I do think it'll be overturned anyway. I find that despicable. I think every Republican should refuse to participate 
in an election for which one person has been unconstitutionally removed. Well, well, you know, we have our own stuff going on on the Democratic side. Trust me. And I think what they're doing to you and and even Cenk Uger, despite his constitutional arguments on citizenship, I think that's completely wrong. And I think they should have a primary. Yeah, but we have a system of justice. I mean, this uh, this case, it's now in Colorado, will go higher and let the system play out. I mean, I think that the, we have to have some trust in the justice system. It'll be interesting to see what the Supreme Court says, but the Supreme Court, I'm sure, will be weighing in on this. They could just say, no, we won't get involved. In Texas v. Pennsylvania in 2020, the Supreme Court said not interested. Shocking. A lot of people, are you familiar with what happened? in with, with what? Which Te- one? Texas v. Pennsylvania was uh, a lawsuit in 2020 and 2021 pertaining to procedural changes that violated the Constitution. And, uh, in, in the elections held by several states. And the Supreme Court said, we will not weigh in at all. And so that meant uh, issues pertaining to constitutional procedures in federal elections went unanswered. And this is a huge component in why Trump supporters think the election was stolen. It's a, it's a huge component as to why January 6th happened at all. I, it may be one of the biggest, if not the biggest. Yeah, if, if the Supreme Court had heard that case, if, the, if they had actually heard the case and just had a, had a decision on it, I am willing to bet that January 6th doesn't happen at all. There's so no this is, right. Who, this is 48 states involved in a lawsuit. Well, this is four, so 48 states were involved in a lawsuit to the Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to weigh on the legality of executives and judiciaries altering procedure in elections. Texas <laughs> argued that the Constitution gives unilateral authority to the legislature to determine how an election is run. And the legislature has to have final say on the certification. If the election is changed outside of the purview of the legislation, then the the, uh, the, uh, legislature, the legislative branch of the state must approve those changes. So in Pennsylvania, for instance, you had changes to voting laws in Georgia. You had the, the governor making changes. Texas said, how are we supposed to participate in an election when these states are in violation of the rules of the election for which we are participating? And the Supreme Court said, not interested because the supreme court was leaving it to the states to be in charge of their elections well this didn't answer the question of uh the the constitution says the legislative branch has the, has the final say the supreme court saying we don't care if a governor ignores the legislative branch outright says there is no answer to be given as to whether or not this violates the constitution so everyone's left in limbo shrugging like yeah what but, do we do but those wait look at what happened in 2000 the the constitution says that states are in charge of their elections talk the about judicial is. overreach the the supreme court said florida wouldn't couldn't count its own votes date, that is unconstitutional the date came and went though about the, the 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 reason of the, the they had to stop is because the end date came no they the, said that because they felt it would uh, be an unusual burden but on I, I, bush i it, you know i got to be honest i just don't think i'm old enough to, to have that be relevant to my view of what happened in 2020. Yeah. So I absolutely respect your position on it. Mm-hmm. My well, point is, so the constitution actually says the legislative branch is up to the legislative branches of the states to determine of how the they're- the states, that's my point. Right, not the governor and not judges. So if a judge changes the rules to an election, the question raised by Texas was, hey, whoa, 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 the constitution and, and per the Supreme Court's own rulings, you know, the legislative branch should be determining the final outcome of their uh, uh, how the auctions are run, not a judge changing at the last minute. And the Supreme Court just said, not interested. And so this was an original jurisdiction lawsuit. It wasn't an appeal. There was no answer given as to whether or not states, uh, the legislative branch must be the, the principal factor in determining their elections. So you end up with 48 states involved. I believe it was 48 Texas v. Pennsylvania, and then every other state joined sides, either with Pennsylvania or Texas, uh, amicus briefs flying through the air. And it was only Thomas and Alito who said, we need to answer this question. The rest said, leave us out of it. So what happens? Trump supporters say the Supreme Court has abandoned us. They've not answered the question of how the elections are supposed to be run, combined with the fraud narrative and a bunch of other things results in a lot of people losing their minds. But uh, I agree with Phil. I think that if the Supreme Court weighed in, and gave a simple opinion. Then you don't think that uh, that Donald Trump would have claimed that the election was stolen? Oh, he wouldn't no, have no, had he to absolutely because- would have. And well, you no, don't no, think you're that wrong. the crowd would have walked you over you, to the Capitol? If the Supreme Court took the case and ruled on the merits, Donald Trump would be president. Oh. Uh, well, okay, all right, so fair enough. 
But he, he I certainly don't agree. If they well, if they had ruled if they had ruled that it, it was if they had actually taken it and said no, it's fine. The Supreme Trump Court wasn't. ruled that a governor does not have the right to change how votes are counted without the approval of the legislature. Mike Pence would have been required to send those votes from numerous states back to the legislature to approve. The legislatures were Republican and probably would have partisanly just sided with Trump. Trump would have had nothing to complain about. Because the Supreme Court, I believe the only correct ruling and the reason why they didn't take it up was that in Georgia, you had the governor issuing rulings on how the election would be run in violation of the Constitution. It was the secretary of state. Also in violation of the Constitution, which says that the legislative branch runs the elections and determines how they're. So if this, I think the reason the Supreme Court rejected this is they knew the end result would be not that they would determine Trump as president, but that they would say only the legislative branch decides immediately then the legislative branches of these states would say we hereby nullify those results let me ask you a question the constitution says the states are in charge does the constitution say the state legislature yes. is in charge it says the state legislature has final say on the running of the elections yeah specifically, specifically. And that's why that was that's why there was a, a challenge brought because the it wasn't the legislature making the judge uh, for instance in in so. pennsylvania this was big a lower court judge ruled that the uh, uh the the universal mail-in voting bill was actually unconstitutional constitutional on the merits but it was appealed by democrat groups to the state supreme court and the supreme court ruled despite the fact the constitution does bar you mail-in votes we will allow this to happen that's why texas sued pennsylvania saying whoa whoa your own state constitution says you can't have universal mail-in voting and you're doing it anyway so they said, Supreme Court, you need to stop this. This is in violation of their own constitution. But maybe the state legislature had given that. Maybe the state legislature had. They did. All right. Well, if the state legislature had, state legislature had said to the election board or to the secretary of state or had given there, that, and then that more. is the final say. It is not. Because the law of Pennsylvania states that in order to amend the constitution legislatively, there has, there's a, a series of procedures that must be done. The state legislature abandoned the procedures for amending the Constitution and decided to force through a bill anyway. It was a bipartisan agreement between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans thought that if they got rid of the single party voting, that the idea was someone could go in and just hit all Democrat and then throw their vote in and not have to worry about names. The Republican legislature said, we'll give you universal mail in voting if you get rid of down down ballot party voting. However, many people in the state said, whoa, whoa, you can't do that. That violates the Constitution. This is an unconstitutional deal between Republicans and Democrats. They went to court and a lower court judge ruled correct. It is unconstitutional to have universal mail-in voting. Democratic groups appealed to the state Supreme Court who said, no, 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 this should be allowed. Texas then intervened and said, how can we be party to an election in this country if a state's in violation of its own constitution and a judge altered the rules in violation of the federal constitution? They asked for an answer from the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, not interested. Everybody loses their minds. Because Pennsylvania had the right to do what Pennsylvania wanted to do. Pennsylvania does not have the right to supersede its own constitution. But like, the government the, is still, you, the government still has yeah, to like, follow look, the hold law. On, let, let me, if, if they want to change the law, they, if they Republican, change it. If Republicans right now in the House voted to ban free speech, would you say that's okay? No. Well, the Constitution protects us, right? But we have a Supreme Court. That's why there are three co-equal branches of government. The Supreme Court would then have a chance to weigh in on that and would consider and would, would would say that that law is unconstitutional. So, and in this what instance, if the Supreme Court but, but, just said we're not going to weigh in. Well, I would agree on that one. <laughs> you know, that's the point that they they, so, they refused to weigh in on something that was in the issue. I of, don't. I don't think. I, even if there's, you know, a lot of the things you're bringing up, I do remember vaguely that there was this stuff with Texas and Pennsylvania. But I'd have to like think about it and read about it to weigh in too much on that. I can tell you this, however, I do not believe that that was the reason, no matter what he said, that Donald Trump, you know, I don't think Donald Trump was taking this big sophisticated a argument. reason. Yeah, I'm sorry. Not the reason. And I don't think that the people who went over to the <laughs> to the cons to the uh, Capitol that day and bashed in the window said, you know, it's all because of Texas and Pennsylvania. What do you, th what do you think about the uh, criminal charges against the people from January 6th? Like, I think uh, that we have a criminal justice system. But but in, uh, a specific example, Enrique Tarrio was not there. Pardon? In Enrique Tarrio was not in D.C. But the what the jury, and there was a jury there, this was the the Proud Boys? He's, yeah, Enrique Tarrio was the chair yeah, of the Proud yeah. Boys. So the jury said, based on things that he had, had done with groups of people, that he had done on Facebook, et cetera, a jury 
decided his culpability. Do you think that a D.C. jury was a jury of his peers? Well, I think that that's if he had wanted to argue that he could not get a fair trial in, in Washington, then the legal system is such that he could have made that argument. He did. They said no. And they said no. This Listen, it, it, this is interesting. There's going to be a civil war in this country. You're saying there's going to be? I, I think it is an absolute fact. And, I, and I'll tell you. Be, so you think that the law is being weaponized against everybody having anything to do with January 6th? 20 years? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so first, did you know that there are people who are acquitted on January 6th because uh, they showed up, open sidewalks, no gates, police fanned them in and opened the doors. And then when they went to court, they said, Your Honor, here's a video of the cop welcoming me in. The cop said, you're right, case dismissed. Did you know that? And they should be dismissed in that case. Did you know that's hundreds of them? If, if that is all that someone did, then they should be acquitted. And there are people who are going to, uh, uh, people I've met who are going to jail for 18 months because an hour after the riot, on the other side of the building, Trump was speaking. He finishes speaking. The riot is already happening. After the riot was cleared out, there were many people who showed up, no barricades, no signs, and the police opened the doors. There's one family that I met. They were not party to any violence. They walked up the sidewalk with little American flags. They were cops holding the door open. They waved, walked in, looked around. They said they were there for about three minutes, shrugged and said, no, that was cool. And then a few months later, the FBI came to their house in the middle of the night or in the early hours of the morning, arrested them in front of their children, brought them to trial. And when they argued, we were there an hour after all this. There were no signs. There was no barricades. The police let us in. They said, we don't care. Guilty. 18 months. Well, that sounds wrong to me. And that's a lot of these people. Well, uh, you know, that 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 is like hard to believe. <clears throat> it's true. Um, well, and I'm not listen, I'm not saying that the legal system never makes mistakes either. But was that a case that was tried by a jury? Yes. Uh, so what did the jury say? What was the what was the prosecution's argument? Trump in supporters case? are insurrectionists. You go to jail. I don't know. I'd this have is, to this read is, about this, Tim. I mean, and, so and, and, and I, I, yeah. I, I agree. I think you should. But yeah, I mean, I don't I don't I, I'm not trying to say you're not saying the truth, but I'm saying some of these conversations I would have to read. And read I, I completely comments. understand. So the reason why I said there's going to be a civil war is I do not think you will find 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump are willing to accept that a man who was not at January 6th is going to prison for 20 years for posting on, I believe it was Getter, quote, don't leave. And for that, they sentenced Enrique Tarrio to 20 years in prison. They're not posting. They're not sending him for 20 years only for that. What, what did he do? They say that he had to do with the entire setup and the entire planning and the entire uh, making it happen. He's not going to jail just for saying don't leave. Are you? Have you read the court documents? I read an article about it. I have not read the court documents. So, so my point could be, let's put it this way. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe May you're wrong. Yeah, uh, we can shake hands on that. And so the issue then becomes a man is going to prison for 20 years. Donald Trump voters will not accept that. Well, Donald Trump voters need to read the court documents as apparently you and I do as well. But uh, I did. I did. That's my point. My point is I did read the case. We covered it quite extensively. We've had Enrique on the show uh, several times. So you're saying that he's being a jury is sending him to jail for 20 years. And you're saying it's only because he said don't leave. I think they're sending him to jail because he's a prominent Trump supporter and the chair of the Proud Boys. But you're, this this argument would suggest that this massive conspiracy no, by it's, which it's everybody, every jury member is talking to every... Do you, do you think that if you uh, were tried by a trial of, of Trump's most ardent supporters, they'd be fair to you? They. This is why you have jury questioning before someone is even allowed onto no, but, the jury. I would hope... DC I, is 90 plus percent Democrat. But still they have... But a Democrat... A Democrat is different than whether or not. A, you think, a, if, you think somebody, Joe Biden would get a fair trial in, in Montana? I think that there are. I think we are, at es, in essence, a, a purple nation in our hearts. And I think people are interrogated before they're allowed to sit on a jury. And if they say things that are clearly prejudicial, then they are not allowed to sit on that jury. So let's 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 try this. The people who supported Donald Trump enough to go and storm into the Capitol, right? Yes. Uh, Trump got 74 million votes. Not every single person would agree with that, but 250,000 people were in D.C. that day to support Donald Trump. People holding that sentiment, do you think they would fairly assess a criminal trial against, say, Hunter Biden? Listen, I, I have two very close friends who are Trump supporters, but I think that they would wish to give someone a fair trial no matter who they were. 
I so, don't think that wh- who who you support politically. I like to think that there is a center of conscience in this country. The fact that I support someone politically doesn't mean I'm going to sacrifice my integrity or my adherence to the law. So where are the criminal prosecutions for the rioters in tw- uh, in 2017 in on January 20th? Does it set fire to vehicles, torched things in the streets, smashed windows, uh, beat police? Anytime, anytime there is anyone who acts outside the law, there is a reason for them to be held accountable. So my Th- question that's is, why, that's why Lady, you know, Lady if, if Justice is, if, has a blindfold. If on. it is fair, then yeah. why is it that the far left extremists who uh, set fires and vandalized and destroyed things in D.C. not only were they acquitted, uh, I should say not even acquitted, the charges were dropped, but they were paid out a, mo- a million dollar settlement. Why is it that in in Washington D.C. when the far left destroys, burns, and and vandalizes and bangs on the doors and smashes their way into these buildings, nothing? Well, first, first, first of all, rioting in the street is different than no. But I mean, like when they like the United States. I mean, like when they go in for the death of the vice president with the guillotine. Sure, but let's 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 compare, say, like uh, a guy who uh, the, the Q shaman, for instance, right? You're familiar with the Q shaman? He was escorted into the building by police. They walk him around on video, trying to open doors for him and lead him to the Senate chamber. Why did that guy go to prison? But the people who occupied and disrupted Congress for, say, abortion rights or for the, for the Dakota Access Pipeline, when, they do, when, the, when the left goes and occupies congressional buildings by force, Wait there's no— Wait a minute. The, the, we're talking about individuals, uh, right? Our elected, our elected representatives were afraid for their lives. The building was stormed. But we I'm had, not talking about that. But 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 you are when you're talking about the difference between the shaman the who was led in by police. I'm saying, pardon, who was escorted in by police. Well, so I'm comparing a specific instance where a guy is brought in by the police officers who give him a tour, open the door for him, and show him where to go. He's he's surrounded by cops. They give him a guided tour on video. It's this is all uh, you can watch it. My question is, in that particular instance, this one guy who's like notorious is he goes to prison? Or uh, how about a better example? Owen Schroyer did not enter the building. Owen Schroyer was at a permanent rally on the Capitol grounds, and he went to prison and just got out last week. And what were the what 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 had he said? Had he exhorted people to enter the building? Had he exhorted people to violence? I think he said things like "Democrats are communists and communists communists should die" or something. Against the law. Well, he went to prison for it. Well, I, you know, once again, Tim, I'd have to read about that. I mean, I don't, I don't know about that particular case. So but I think we can agree that the that people should be. Not only to be held accountable, but to be held fairly accountable and that the legal system should be fair to everyone. Should That's be. what we can agree on. I suppose the issue for me is and the reason why I say there will be a civil war is because when it comes to a general conversation with the public, they believe lies from the corporate press about what really happened that day and on other days. And it results in torture, solitary confinement, political persecutions. And <clears throat> this is all actively happening right now. You do st- think that some of the people who came into the building that day were acting violently. We see that as well. Yes. You, you do and believe they, that they should, some people. I did. believe a lot of them. Okay. And I believe they should go to jail for, for a good amount of time. Okay, 20, good. 20 years, however. Well, to, you know, once again, that's up to a jury and a judge. It's our legal system. So the problem then becomes at a certain point, if Antifa, uh, the Summer of Love riots, uh, firebomb the White House, which they did, where's the, where's the May 29th hearings? Why, why do we not have a May 29th commission on the firebombing of the White House and St. John's Church? Listen, I, I, once again, this is why, why Lady, Lady Liberty has a blindfold on. This is why prosecutors should try to be fair, obviously. Well, no, no, I, I get it. Fair. So what it comes down to, I believe, is that you don't know about it. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean, don't know about the, about the, which, about the, the specific the, cases on January 6th? No, no, no. The firebombing of the White House on May 29th, 2020. May tw- firebombing of the White House? No, I don't. Firebombing of the White House on May 29, 2020. So I assume that you're saying it's because the corporate media did not want me to know. I mean, no, I, honestly, it was reported widely. There were photos of smoke rising all over D.C. It was a mass riot. They were making May fun of Donald Trump because he had Donald, to go down to Donald, the Donald, Yeah, uh, Donald bunk, Trump was forced into bunker. a bunker. The police came out and started pushing people out. But there's been no hearings. There's been no commission. St. John's Church was set on fire. This is a historic American church where I know that church. It's they set it on fire. Where I live. Far left extremists firebombed the White House grounds. The reason you don't know 70, about it. 70 plus firebombed throwing Molotov cocktails at the White House and torched a guard post. 70 plus police officers were injured. And so in what the, happened? Nothing. Nothing. 
The reason you don't know about it is because the media doesn't make a big deal about it. I disagree. It's I disagree. I think it's because, I, with, all, with all due respect, I don't think you read the news the way Trump supporters and we do. Well, I'm not saying we so as Trump too. supporters. I mean, there's, well, those two things are not mutually exclusive. I think that the average I mean, the liberal algorithms and so forth, because I do read the news and I do watch and I am think of myself as informed and I'm not. But I'll look. Trust me, I'll look. I think what happens is the average liberal is getting their news and information from pundits, not from news sources. Well, and, I think that's what's wrong with our with our news media today. But it's more people's opinions than it is uh, accurate reporting. So for uh, we, we are being we get smeared all the time as um we, we have this one agency trying to smear us as fake news, despite the fact we use NewsGuard, which is a certification agency which gives, speaks highly of the New York Times and all the corporate press. All the sources we use are always certified as credible, but they attack us because in terms of punditry, if you watch Chris Matthews or Rachel Maddow, they're lying to you. John Oliver is one of the most deceptive and manipulative <clears throat> people. Jimmy Kimmel is, is I, I view him as malicious evil. He wished uh, uh, death upon his own friend live on television. What a despicable man. And then if you watch Fox News, it's like fairly bad, but not that bad. You got You definitely got to do your own reading. But well, we should read Super Chats. I know when it comes. Because I'm just ranting. When it comes to a lot of the people that you were mentioning, uh, you know, on MSNBC and CNN, what I experience, which is really chilling, is just complete invisibilization, erasure. You know, when I was first, when I first announced that I was running for president, I heard a woman say on CNN, she was obviously very miffed that I was running. And she said, I think we should just ignore her. We should just pretend that she's not running. And I thought, well, good luck. And that's exactly what they did. That's their playbook. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, at 13% this week on Quinnipiac, which, which is really amazing considering the fact that I do not get that exposure on those channels. Let's, uh, let's, let's just pretend she's not there. I'll go a little bit long to read Super Chats because that's my fault. And I, I, there, are, there are some very nice things people are saying uh, to you and some good questions. Allie L says, Marianne, I've been blessed by your work for 15 plus years and I appreciate you. Please consider reading the early church fathers and their writings pertaining to Jesus Christ. God bless you and Merry Christmas to the whole Tim cast crew. Cheers. That's very sweet. nice. <laughs> so, so they're, they're nice, right? You know, uh, positive people. Yes. The Sig P says, with all due respect, as soon as they show her the JFK photo, she is going to fold to the will of the party. Acknowledging the issue is not enough. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What? So Which the, JFK photos are we? Just a plain old picture of JFK. So the, 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 the joke is, the reason why we don't get change is take any presidential candidate who says good oh, things. I see. The moment they sit down in the office, a guy from the CIA sits down and says, just wanted to leave this with you. And they slide a picture at JFK. The implication is. Yeah, I understand. No. Yeah. <laughs> you do as you're told. I would like to say, I would like to think I would get on television immediately, on live television, let the people and say, I am, uh, I guess I would say that I'm resigning right now, uh, <laughs> but I want you to know what's going on in your country. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Gnarly Marley says the Grapes of Wrath, Tom Sawyer, and To Kill a Mockingbird were banned by leftists, not the right. No, that's not true. I know, I know Tom Sawyer was banned by leftists. That's, oh, the Tom Sawyer issue is different, and it right. should not have been banned. But yeah. Grapes of Wrath and to Kill a Mockingbird, not. I think the issue is uh, there's a difference between not in the curriculum and banning the book outright. And a lot of what the argument is is around how curriculum. Would, how, how can you say that the Grapes of Wrath should not be in a curriculum? Oh, I'm not saying that. It's one of the great works of American literature, of world literature. <clears throat> Maybe age appropriate or something. Like... So the issue is... The idea that Grapes of Wrath, anybody saying Grapes of Wrath should not be read by anyone for any reason is chilling to me. I, 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 I don't disagree. I, I'm just pointing out that a lot of what conservatives are saying is don't put this in curriculum, leave it in the library. Why? Why if a school... I'm not talking about Grapes of Wrath. You were asking... I'm not talking about Grapes of Wrath. I'm saying a lot of the books that even like we have say shouldn't be in the schools, a lot of conservatives are like, no, 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 just it shouldn't be required reading. So when I'm talking about Grapes of Wrath or To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm saying that a lot of the books that have been brought up by the right that they say should be removed, they're not arguing for an outright ban. But like, name name a book. It's one thing to talk about whether kids, you know, stuff about sex in the seventh grade. But that's that's what it is. So, okay, well, that's very different. So, some of it is like... That's very different. If this one should be age appropriate, then it should not be available to children in the library. It can be presented in sex ed with parental permission or whatever. Yeah. So it's not about a ban. It's about how they present but it. But these, I was reading about this woman who 
comes up with this list about about what books should be banned, and she admits that she hardly ever read a book in her life, and anything that has any any implication of sexual feelings to her is pornographic. This is about this woman. This is, uh, I think, telling a, a literature <clears throat> teacher what they can teach is awful. Let's uh, at Missy Kin says, how hard will Marianne fight back when the DNC doesn't allow her on the ballot? Bernie didn't fight back at all. Okay, well, right now we're we've got I've been posting about it. We've got Florida, we've got Tennessee, we've got Massachusetts, we've got North Carolina. The issue is how do you fight back? Are you going to fight back with a lawsuit? Well, you talk to a lawyer and you say, well, what would uh, what would be uh, the cost of going after this on the issue? Let's say of Florida, where the DNC, the Republic, the Democratic Party of Florida, basically said to the state of Florida, to the Secretary of State, Joe Ballot, Joe Biden is the only person that we're going to have on the ballot, which is so wrong. I'm an FEC filed registered candidate. I've been out there. I've been campaigning. I've been covered by <clears throat> by the news. But that right there is an estimated $75,000 just for that one case wow. in Florida. So as a, as a candidate, you say, where do I spend campaign funds? It costs tens of thousands of dollars, ultimately hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get on these ballots, plus uh, $10,000 for the voter files in every, in every state. So are you going to spend $75,000 fighting Florida? And then you begin to see what has happened, which is, oh, this is not just Florida. This is, they're doing it in Tennessee. They're doing it in North Carolina. This week they were doing it in Massachusetts. So I'm sort of holding powder dry because the bigger problem is that it's a pattern. I think the main point here that matters has to do with the function of political parties. George Washington warned us about them in his farewell address, and he said that they could form factions of men who were more loyal to their party than to their country. And John, uh, John Adams said that they were a threat to democracy. So the point here is that traditionally the political party stood in the background, let the voters decide who the nominee would be, and then the party came in. So to me, candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. So how, how, how much will I fight? Uh, as as uh, you know, certainly as much as I can, uh, spending seventy five thousand dollars just to go after a case in Florida when you also have the the cost of everything else and the fact that everything is so expensive is one of the ways the system is rigged. That to me is a bigger issue. So, uh, elegant news. I'm going to rephrase your uh, uh, your statement because it's kind of a question, but I'm going to rephrase it so it's easier to just uh, read out in reference to the the uh, Enrique Tarrio in, in the sentencing. Would you agree with black people being sentenced to long prison sentences if the jury de de determines that's what should happen? I, I, I believe in the jury system. I don't think that it's always perfect, but I believe that we, listen, like I said, I don't agree with the Supreme Court decision in, 20, in 2000, but that doesn't mean I was going to burn down the Supreme Court building. So, so juries come up with their decisions. Some of them are fair. Some of them are obviously unfair, but it's the best that we have. Would, would you do you think that uh, do you think like a jury of uh, uh, white people from a wealthy suburb are going to be fair to a uh, impartial to like a black man accused of selling drugs? Well, I think that's why they have this. That's why this question. That's why often it is, you know, there is a movement for a, a case to be tried elsewhere for that reason. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the system that one can argue that one this person could not get a fair trial in this area. I mean, that happens all the time. If a judge were to say. A fair trial would not be possible, so we're going to do it here anyway. Would you find that acceptable in terms of how our system is supposed to work? No, but I've never heard a judge say that. So, a, ju a judge, I've never heard a judge say, and by the way, I'm having a little difficulty here because I think now it's a little too loud, and I don't know if I'm talking weird because I'm... No, you're, okay. you're, you're um, uh, I've never heard a judge say, I admit you couldn't get a fair trial here, but we're going ahead with the trial anyway. And I don't agree with every judge, but that's just something. And what do you think would be like, let's say that hypothetically happened and there was someone who was who was being charged with a crime and the judge said they, they petitioned for a change of venue. And the judge says there is there's nowhere you can go that will free you from the bias of this place. So we're doing it here anyway. I don't think that would be right. And somebody would be petitioning somebody. I mean, even in those cases, there is such a thing as judicial prejudice. Somebody would be. Uh, would be arguing that there was judicial prejudice and this, this, the case would not stop there. What if the case did stop there? And the if the case did stop there, I'd be the first to say this is wrong. So will you stand up in defense of Derek Chauvin? 
<gasps> wow. Derek, Derek Chauvin, Chauvin. I under- petitioned I know for a change Derek of venue. Chauvin. Are you and the judge yes, said, there is no there is no venue you can go to where you'll be free of any bias, so we do it here anyway. So is the issue... Wasn't there some legitimacy to that, given the fact that everybody saw the video? Everybody saw the video, so how could there be lack of prejudice anywhere? Right. So, so are you so, saying... So, so the question is, is about uh, the Constitution and what is fair in the court of law and not what we want to have happened because of our feelings. I so don't think if the doctor. issue is a judge says there will be no fair trial for you, my argument is then there's no trial at all. And the man should be released because that's a limitation of our democratic system. That's what your argument would be? Absolutely. Okay, so you if and a, I totally disagree on that one. If a court yeah. cannot okay. grant a fair trial under, under the Constitution, then the court cannot imprison a person. Yeah, well, you and I don't agree on that one. So you, you think, think you think that uh, people should be the state should be allowed to imprison people even without due process? I think that there that that was an overriding circumstance of the fact that the the judge was correct. There could that that was there were very few people in the United States who had not seen the video. That's all the judge was saying. The judge was saying, "You do we're going to ha- do our best. We're going to do our best in the way we interrogate people to make sure that they will be as non-prejudiced as possible." But but the judge was admitting there's no location where it's going to be any different. Do you think it was fair that the uh, other officers involved who were not uh, other officers who were there but not involved in the handling of George Floyd? Do you think it's fair they went to prison? I think I think that there's a lot of accountability uh, in a person who stands there knowing if a, if if you know that somebody is murdering someone and what he was doing, it was reasonable to assume that he would die. Absolutely, I think trying those uh, trying those officers makes sense. What if it was for uh, an op- one of the officers who was holding back the crowd? I wouldn't say holding back, but standing in front of with his arms out because I don't think he made physical contact pushing them or anything. He's going to prison, and uh, his defense was he wasn't actually looking. He didn't know what was going on, and well, as far as he knew, what Chauvin was doing was in line if, with the training okay. that they were given. So, if I was a jury, I'd be listening very, very carefully. Did he did he see what was going on or not? I mean, that's what a trial is for a trial to to prove. You know, if if I saw if it was clear to me as a jury member, no, he saw. And he chose to do nothing. But if somebody else was holding back the uh, crowd and said that he didn't even see, I would listen very carefully. And I would listen to testimony and I would see video and it would make obviously a huge difference whether he knew or not. We're going to go to the members only Uncensored show. I really okay. appreciate it. So uh, we'll be back in about a minute. We went a little long because, you know, I didn't read enough. But uh, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends. Head over to TimCast.com. Click join us, become a member, because we're going to take uh, uh, some calls from the audience. Really do appreciate it. And uh, download the best song ever. Go to thebestsongever.com. Click download your price. This is the last call to action we will have. If everybody listening bought it, we would smash into the Billboard charts. Jeremy Boring, Michael Knowles, me, Carter Banks. We would get to uh, hit that uh, uh, Hot 100, and that would be fun. I don't think we're going to make it, but with your support, it's possible. Uh, you can follow the show at Timcast IRL. You can follow me personally at Timcast. Marianne, do you want to shout anything out? No. Uh, do I want to say <laughs> shout anything out your website? Uh, oh yeah, that my website is marianne twenty twenty four dot com, and I would welcome people going there. We didn't really talk about political issues as they pertain to my campaign tonight, but if people want to see my issues, and uh, please go to my social media and go to marianne twenty twenty four dot com. Absolutely, and I appreciate it. Right on. Thanks for coming. I am uh, Phil That Remains on Twix. I'm Phil That Remains Official on Instagram. The band is All That Remains. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Pandora, YouTube, you know, the internet. I'm Ian Crossan. Follow me at Ian Crossan on the internet. And Marianne, you are at Mar Williamson on Twitter. Great to see you. Wonderful night. You too. We just got started. That was hot. Serge, talk me out. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excited for the after show. Uh, pleasure to have you here, Marianne. Thank you Thank very much you. for coming. Appreciate Thank it. You. It's always good to have people with uh, different viewpoints than uh, the average on the show as far as our, as our audience is concerned. Thank Anyways, you. guys, I'm Serge.com. Yeah, let's go to the after show. We'll see you all over at TimCast.com. Thanks for hanging out.